where does strength play in regards to building muscle? Powerlifting gave me a good base. It gave me some ass and some hamstrings. Do I really need carbs to build muscle? Using them around your workout can help your workout performance and you don't need to worry about eating them during the day if that's something that you're worried about eating too many carbs. Can muscle burn be an effective metric for muscle building? Yeah, I think so. I think the muscle, what, he heats up, right? That's what a pump is, man. Yeah. Any tips on grip strength and forearm size? Check out some stuff that the arm wrestlers do. Like you want big ass forearms, those guys do a lot of crazy exercises for their forearms. Can you build good muscle with only body weight exercises? They're really effective. You know, yeah. going out and doing some sprints is really effective. Best muscles to target to look bigger quicker. When you think about people that are big, he almost always has a big back. It's like kind of hard to avoid. Hey, move school. <laughs> Did you try your mackerel yet? Dude. <laughs> so you still nervous? No, I had every intention on eating my mackerel yesterday. <laughs> I promise you. I ate my normal breakfast and I just simply was not hungry all day. Oh. I kept looking at it. I'm like, all right, yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna eat that mackerel <laughs> in a little bit. Walked past it, like I'm just not not really hungry right now, and I don't want I don't want to give it a fair shot. I want to give it a, 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 a t like a time where I'm hungry and I actually want to like potentially enjoy this. If you mackerel. don't eat that bitch today, just bring it here. I'll chomp I'm it up right to at the time. Eat it, okay? I promise. Right, you better don't waste. I some really good fish, bro. really want to. Mark's been talking about the benefits of the DHA or and vitamin omega D yep. threes, and mm -hmm. and I don't eat that sort of thing, so I want to. Take advantage of it. And so I want to eat that. But who in here likes fish? Comment down below. Let us know in that box. And by the way, like I mentioned in the Discord, we're going to try to focus on muscle building questions, but ask anything you want. Yeah, build some muscles. Get big. Get strong. Big. Muscles are overrated, though. It's true. Having big muscles means that it's more in your muscles and less in your brain. Well, there's that. And then also, muscles just make you really tired. Because you got to lug them around all day, and they have to be fed. That's a bitch. They, uh, they take a lot of maintenance. And then you lose your mobility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of it. It's the worst thing ever. You yeah. don't want muscle. You don't want muscle for jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was, how long did oh, that shit. take? God, dude, that's <laughs> Literally, not that took less than 90 <laughs> seconds, and <laughs> we already got the first jujitsu. <laughs> can, we, can we get a siren that just, like, goes off and just messes everything up, and it just, like... <laughs> You should make something on your fucking clicker button thing. <laughs> soundboard. All right, soundboard. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right, guys. Let's start answering some of these questions. Guess who the first question is from? It's okay. uh, our boy. With, uh, no, just take me. No, I can't. All right, gunpowder tea. Gunpowder tea. Gunpowder tea with the super chat. Best recovery modalities for leg workouts. Ooh. Training legs can be really brutal. Yeah, mm. dude, yeah. Especially when you're really trying to get after it and trying to make the legs grow. You're kind of forced to... Uh, Train them hard enough to where you can't walk so great. Mm -hmm. But I think um, some of the greatest kind of recovery tools that I ever ran into were just the simple things of like just taking your time to get used to it. Mm. You know, it's very simple rules. Like just, you know, if, if you're like, if you wake up one day and like my legs are skinny and I want to, I want to slap some meat on these legs and you start getting inspired to do some leg workouts, well, maybe like 10 sets of 10 on the first day is not a great idea. Mm -hmm. And so think about, um, you know, what you've done previously, because um, you're only as good as that, and uh, prepare yourself to go up just a little bit from uh, where you currently are. Don't, don't try to just all of a sudden just blast your legs with tons and tons of volume. You'll get super sore and not feel great. That after leg day, take a walk. I think that's one of the best things that you can do mm -hmm. because um, walking is obviously just a good thing for recovery in general, but the amount of like blood flow and blood you're going to get moving throughout your legs all the way down to your feet back mm -hmm. up, right? That's going to be pretty helpful. Um, and I also think that adding in certain movements that will allow you to work your legs through long ranges of motion, a movement that I think is beneficial for every athlete is a... ATG split squat. Mm. And now before it became popular for ATG and, and Ben, right? Charles Poliquin was, mm. that yeah. was like the split squat that he popularized back in the day. I think he maybe call it the Poliquin split squat. Now mm -hmm. people call it the ATG split squat, but that's movement that I think is literally good for everybody to progress. It's going to stretch. It's going to get you to stretch. It's a unilateral leg movement, deep knee flexion on the front leg, 
the hips on the back leg are getting stretched out. Mm -hmm. Your like you even your torso because the goal is to keep your torso upright, so you're feeling a deep stretch throughout like your psoas in this area. It's it's such a beautiful movement that I think on leg day is something that can actually help you recover faster. It's a great movement for athletics. I mean, you think about um, like a pitcher or uh, a batter in baseball or somebody throwing really hard from third to first. They almost get in that position. Yeah. Somebody dunking a basketball. You don't really think about somebody dunking a basketball getting super low, but a lot of times their back leg is almost as low as somebody in an ATG split squat. You just, all you have to do is, you know, watch Ben do like, uh, you know, when he puts some of these dunks uh, in reverse and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. But to generate a lot of force, um, it's, it's important to do movements like that. I also think that um, over the years, I don't know if this is more like intuition or if this is actual, if there's actual like a lot of science to it, uh, but it does seem like movement is really important. You mentioned walking. I know some people like to get on like an Airdyne bike, getting on some sort of bike. Um, I know for myself, when my legs have been really sore, getting on a bike and having my legs kind of pushed into these ranges of motion that kind of hurt mm -hmm. because you're so sore. Yep. Um, and then you move for a little while and, and I don't know what the terminology is. Maybe you're moving around some lactic acid or something like that. I don't know. But I know that like even just 10 minutes of that can make a huge difference. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, my legs actually feel better. And I do know that you, you know, just by simply doing exercise for these body parts, you can assist with getting more nutrients to those body parts. So if you trained legs on Monday and you went real hard and you went crazy on your legs, and then Tuesday, you also, you know, get on a bike, you do a little bit of walking, you should be able to drive more nutrients there to assist with the recovery process. Something that absolutely helped me was uh, kind of splitting out leg day throughout the, the week. So if I'm mm, going to do- Smart move. If I'm going to work uh, quads one day, then I'm not going to work hamstrings that day either. Or maybe I will, but I'm not going to do calves or something like that. Or I'm going to do glutes, but I'm going to do that on a separate day. Mm -hmm. But that's how that's what worked for me. But do you guys think that if somebody is trying to add some size to to their legs, should they hit legs multiple times that week? Like it, it, if they're not splitting it up, if they're having like a leg day that where they want to gain some size, mm. should they hit that leg day workout more than once a week? I think it depends on their adaptation to volume in general. Mm -hmm. Because when a lifter becomes more advanced and a lifter be like adapts to what they're currently doing, then they're going to be able to first off like like maybe they'll be able to handle more volume on a specific day and then recover and then handle more volume on a second day during the week, right? Whereas if like you're new to training your legs, you probably don't need to do a lot of volume on specific days because you're not you're not adapted to that yet. So as a lifter gets better, they can probably have more frequency and gain benefit from it. Whereas a newer person with high frequency is just going to beat themselves up. I do think you don't have to get yourself like insanely sore. I do think that sometimes that's part of the process because you just don't know and you're going to have workouts that are going to end up like that where you maybe even tried to undershoot the volume. You tried to go with uh, not a lot of sets, not a lot of exercises, and you still got really sore. Like that just happens sometimes because you're so new that you don't, uh, understand what you're adapted to and what you're not adapted to. But I really like what you said about, you know, sp spreading out the amount of days that you're going to do it. Like maybe you are training your legs three days a week, but maybe one day is more quad focused. The other day is a little bit more hamstring focus. And another day is like a little bit more calf tib mm -hmm. uh, focus. And then you kind of repeat. I found it really useful to me at this stage in my life to, um, I, like my leg, my leg day, my leg focus day, it's like I do one or two exercises and then I move on to something else. Now, I also already acquired a decent amount of muscle mass on my legs. So I don't maybe have to push through the same way as somebody else, but I actually think it's a smart move to put something else on your leg day, almost like shoulders, maybe like maybe you work quads and like shoulders because that kind of forces you to only train your legs for like X amount of time you know, 30 minutes or so. And that might be a good place to start. Like if you're trying, because I, again, when I think about leg day, I'm just thinking of like, man, like I spent a lot of days, like not being able to get up and down stairs and being real fumbly and just uh, having my legs be incredibly sore. And my legs did not grow very well from that. I used to just like, I used to try to kill them and it, it didn't, for me, it didn't work. I don't know why it didn't work, but it didn't work well. And it wasn't until after my powerlifting career that my legs 
which doesn't make any sense either because it didn't grow from a lot of volume and it didn't grow from good being he- going heavy. Uh, it grew more from like me just, um, I guess, utilizing like almost straight bodybuilding tactics. Mm-hmm. Mark, can you explain, because like you've mentioned this in the past, or I mean, both of you guys have talked about this, how powerlifting did make your 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 bo- your muscles grow and stuff. But like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole concept of like going heavier versus like hypertrophy. And mm-hmm. I know the answer is both. But, you know, what you just said there too is like after powerlifting, you got bigger, but people that are into bodybuilding, they're not really worried about lifting as much weight as possible. Or maybe they are. But the the main thing is like they want to build that hypertrophy and they want to go with the higher reps. So where does strength play in regards to building muscle for the legs? I think powerlifting gave me a good base. Like it gave me some ass and some hamstrings <laughs> and maybe even some calves. Like calves could also have been like genetic or something too or just uh, environmental, playing football and playing a bunch of other sports. So maybe that was part of it. But um, I think powerlifting helped give my legs some size, but they didn't have any shape. They were just like, they were just like, <laughs> they're just like blocks, you know? They, <laughs> they didn't have much, uh, much shape to them. And then after I was done powerlifting, uh, losing a lot of body fat made a lot of the shape come out and then also utilizing some bodybuilding techniques. But it seems like to me that when you're, put your muscles under stress for 40 seconds to a minute, somewhere in that range. You do eight to 12 repetitions and you do it under control. That, the, that's some of the protocol for hypertrophy. Uh, for, for, gaining, uh, for gaining strength, it's usually done a lot quicker. You know, you're only doing like one rep, maybe five reps, something like that. And you're still utilizing some control. So there's still a lot of muscle tension. Um, but the duration of the exercise is shortened quite a bit. And then there's a lot of crossover between um, gaining strength and gaining muscle mass. So sometimes some people can respond really well to five sets of five. Um, but also sometimes people respond really well to five sets of five because it's uh, such a departure from what they're currently doing that it almost is, uh, it maybe acts as like a, a way to recover from all the sets of 10 and 12 and 15 that they may have been doing previously. Yeah, I think just the, the concept to think about, especially if if your main focus is building muscle and you're not someone who really cares about lifting the most weight possible or competing in powerlifting, then chase the stimulus and then not the weight. And one, one thing to think about here is, like you mentioned, uh, the amount of time that you're working with a load. So the amount of time it's going to take you to do 10 to 15 repetitions, right? with a decent tempo. It was going to take you a little bit of time. But think about this too. The longer you're working a specific muscle group, towards the end of that set, you're tapping into all of the fibers. Versus a set of three, you're going to be utilizing those fibers to move that load fast through space, but you're not fatiguing all of those fibers like you would on a set of 10 to 15, that's like one to two reps shy of failure. Mm-hmm. About 50 seconds in, you're using everything everything to move that load, right? That's why bodybuilders are able to get away with using much lighter weight with much higher reps and they look bigger than powerlifters even though they're weaker than a powerlifter. So, I mean, you can also get the best of both worlds. If you do want to be a strength athlete, you can do some strength work and that can be beneficial for your bodybuilding. But if you're just trying to build muscle, you don't have to do sets of three or five. You don't have to. You can if you want to. And normally bodybuilders are actually really strong. Yeah. I think that that was maybe like a misconception for maybe years. I think maybe in like some parts of the 90s and maybe 2000s, there was a lot of people using machines and stuff. And then somehow that got translated into like meaning that you're not strong. Mm. Um, but I mean, just look at Jay Cutler and look at these guys. I mean, they're insanely strong. It's not only the strong bodybuilders. It's not only the Ronnie Coleman's. And a lot of these guys are really, really strong. And they're strong at like, a lot of different exercises. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to take, um, Michael Hearn is finally starting to get like a little older, but (laughs) if you were to take like any five exercises in in the gym and have him compete against just about anybody else in the world, he would do really well, even against somebody who's probably like in their twenties or something like that, because he's adapted himself to all these different exercises, all these different angles, um, and also doing it for a long ass period of time. And also being Taking like under <coughs> oh, wait, <sorry>. tremendous <laughs> amounts of uh, tension during his training sessions and the trend. You, 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 you pronounced 
testosterone as tension. That's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, guys, we are going to be giving away some things today at the end. Anybody ask questions, and that's why gunpowder, I, I, your tactic, bro, you've, you've won a lot of these giveaways. <laughs> We're giving away something from Joy Mode. All right. Hey. They are a, uh, it'll make your dick work better. Yeah. With the use of citrulline and arginine, it's perfectly natural. Nothing weird's in it. Good Life Proteins, Vivo Barefoot, you can win a pair of shoes. Hey now. Somebody asked actually, uh, where can we get a pair of Encima's orange shoes? These are the Vivo Barefoot Modus Strength shoe, right? Um, if they're sold out of orange right now, I'm sorry, but maybe they'll come out with it. They have a new one coming out too. So anyway, yes, that's at Vivo. Um, hostage tape. We're going to give away a year's supply, and then we're giving away some stuff from within you also. So if you ask a question, we answer it. You're on a list, and then mm. we will pick your, a name out. And if you win, you win. I just want to go back to the question. You know, the question is, like, what's the best recovery? So, like, I do think a sauna can be helpful. A hot tub, for some reason, that's always left out. But I found going into a hot tub just feels incredible. Um, if, if you can meditate, that would be great. I know most people really struggle with it. Um, cold plunge, unbelievable. I think for recovery, I know there's some people who are like, ah, it might interfere with mm -hmm. hypertrophy or whatever, but, but a few hours away. Fucking yeah. Plunge. Right. Do it, do it beforehand or do it the next day or whatever. Like, um, it's a great recovery tool. And then also, you know, just keep it in mind, um, just don't do garbage sets, you know, don't do sets that maybe don't provide value. Like don't do a set just because you're like, this is going to hurt really bad. Like do the set with intention and do the set with the idea of like, I'm doing this to stimulate. Um, I think it was Lee Haney said, stimulate, don't annihilate. So stimulate the muscle, get what you need out of it. And there's really no reason to think like, oh, on my way out the door, I'm really going to smash this last set. <laughs> don't do shit like that because that's going to cut into your recovery. And it's, it's most likely not going to be valuable. It's something that you think about. You're like, oh, I'm going to get this sick pump on my way out the door and I'm going to do this like massive drop set or super set. And it's like, no, what, what you were doing for the whole workout was great. And that's going to be plenty for you to grow off of. But what if the chick working the front desk is really hot and, and you spend two and a half hours training in the same spot? Okay, for as just long making as sure. Possible. Okay, yeah. cool. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next question from Haley Neal Do I really need carbs to build muscle? I think they're valuable. I don't think there's any reason to chop them out. I don't need, I don't know, uh, you know, each person maybe is a little individual, but I would say like start going underneath a hundred grams of carbs a day. It's like, that's, that's pretty low. I think most bodybuilders, most people that you've seen that have good amounts of muscle are probably at a minimum of taking in a gram per pound of body weight in uh, carbohydrates and sometimes 1.5 and sometimes even all the way up to two and sometimes even more. You know, I think Jay Cutler like famously had like a thousand carbs a day or something like that. He wanted to win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It mattered. Yeah. I, it's definitely can help. And if you're someone who's trying to build muscle, I know like, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with using a ketogenic diet or if you like the carnivore diet. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more sparing with your carbs, try to use them uh, around your workout. Okay, so try to maybe have some carbs an hour or two before you work out, maybe 50 or 100 grams or something. Um, and you will feel that because muscle building and bodybuilding is in its nature glycolytic. Uh, you're going to tap into those glycogen stores when you're lifting. That's why you'll notice if you're someone that's coming from like a carnivore diet and then you get some carbs and then you do another workout, you're like, why these pumps hurt? Like the pumps are quite literally skin splitting, especially if you haven't had carbs for a while. So you know how effective they're going to be. Like I've noticed that difference too. So with that being said, if you use them around your workout, during your workout, I know you like to sometimes use Carbomax or mm -hmm. a carbohydrate type supplement yep. drink, and those are definitely beneficial. But using them around your workout can help your workout performance and you don't need to worry about eating them during the day if that's something that you're worried about eating too many carbs. Yeah, some rice and potatoes, some general you know, carbohydrates, I think can make a big difference. Remember it's, it's assisting with hydrating. You know, we know how important hydrating, how hydration is. We know how important it is to have water and to have salt and have minerals. The carbohydrates are literally helping to hydrate uh, the tissue. And it's going to actually make you weigh a little bit more, which some people who are trying to like get skinny might think is a bad thing, but you're going to be full of glycogen. And so therefore your performances should be better. And if you can work out, like, let's just 
throw a percentage on it and say you can work out two or 3% better uh, when you have carbohydrates in your system. Maybe there's some data that shows some other statistic, but I'm just saying like for argument's sake, it makes a two to 3% difference in your output. Like to me, that sounds really valuable for yeah. fat burning, for gaining muscle and so on, and gaining strength. I have a specific Mexican candy that I have like, <laughs> I have like eight bags of it. Why'd you point reserve? to Andrew? <laughs> hey, uh, like, well, you, you've had it. You I'm remember sure I gave I you some of it. I don't remember though. It was one that had, it was like coated with spicy stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's my special pre-workout candy. That's mm-hmm. like, good. I'll only eat it pre-workout and sometimes outside of workout, but I'll, I'll usually <laughs> eat it pre-workout because I'm like, all right, let's get this pump, bro. You know? There's like no fat and stuff like that, right? Nah, it's, it's, just, just, it's just sugar. Right? sugar. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be like a kind of like- it makes sense. Like a fruit by the foot, but with like spicy, oh. sweet goodness all over it. Yeah. It's incredible. Oh, so good. Yeah, real quick. Uh, if if you're digging, the, you know, the, the live so far, please hit that like button because we only have like a couple of likes, but a good amount of people in here. So we appreciate you. But let's hit that like button. About how long should somebody utilize carbs pre workout? Like how long before? I know it's going to vary for everybody, but like, could they do it if they're going to work out in the morning? Could they do it the night before, or is that like too far? Two, hour, two hours? Yeah. Like, what do we got? I think for a lot of people, it's kind of mental. I think they feel like they need the car. So if you feel like you need the carbs and you need to eat some like honey on your way out the door before you go do your workout, then then just <laughs> then just go for it. Like whatever feels good to you, and then also like whatever digests well. Um, but I would say like if you had some carbs at night and you work out, you know, the next day, even before noon or something, those carbs are still sitting around. Mm-hmm. I don't understand where they would have went. <laughs> so uh, they're still in your system. It's not like you're like depleted. I think you would have to fast for, you'd have to fast for like 24 hours to get rid of the glycogen that's like even just in your liver and the glycogen that's sitting around in your muscles like doesn't get moved around. I don't think until you start to really move yourself around a lot. So this is a hack. Actually, I don't even know if I should call it a hack. I just know that like it feels pretty wild and I don't use it all the time. I, there's no side effects. Uh, uh, the supplement from Jake Benson. I don't Benson, think you should tell people about this stuff. <laughs> Max Uptake. You remember that shit? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I, I, so like- Super brain formulated, by the way. Dude, I ate such a big, a fucking fat meal. And then I, I took four Max Uptakes before that meal. And then a few hours after I went to go do a lift- holy shit, I was drenched. And the pump I had looked so crazy. And I was just like, I, I texted Jake right after. I'm like, dude, dude, this shit's awesome. Send me more. It's just a supplement, yeah. <laughs> and I think it has like chromium and stuff like that. I don't yeah. think it has anything, uh, it has nothing in it that that's dangerous or nothing in it's going to hurt you. It just apparently helps you uptake nutrients better. Mm-hmm. That's what it's meant for. So <laughs> is, is it just like cool. an oral supplement or? It's a pill. It's yeah. anal. Yeah, mm. you have to stick yeah. it up your ass. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can do it for you if you. It's it's uh, I was wait. I'm looking at both of you. Like, yeah. who's gonna- <laughs> got you, bro. Anal Just make sure to shave before. Last time I had to do that for you it was too hairy. Down I, do. I don't like that. I it, too much prep work when yeah. I have to shave, and then you want me to wax, and then who knows what else you're gonna want me Pulled to do. Pulled hair next. out of my teeth the next morning it wasn't fun. It's supposed to be Worth sunning it. your butthole. How are you supposed to sun that thing when it's that furry, dude? I don't do everything you guys tell me to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hence why you didn't eat the mackerel just yet. I'm working on it. Couldn't be couldn't be more disappointed. Gotta get hyped up for it. Even though it's a muscle day, we got a running question because Darian Donaldson said that he's been inspired to do his first marathon and he needs some tips. Hell yeah. Mm. I'm not the guy to ask about running that far. That's really far. <laughs> Well, you did one. That's really far. <laughs> Talk to Jeremy Miller. <laughs> um, I, I would say that like, uh, I, I think that you got to kind of proceed with caution. Like if you're just getting excited and out of nowhere, you're going to do a marathon. It's, it's just really far. Yeah. Ooh. It's really, really far. It's really far to even walk. Um, so I would say like, if you don't have the opportunity, um, if, if you don't have previous running history and you don't have the opportunity to train for like 20 weeks, I would just suggest that you don't do it. Um, but I know that people like the mental side of it and they're like, no, I want to do it. I want to make sure that I don't stop and I go the whole way. And they got like a bet with their friend or something like that. Um, in that case, then, you know, I, I would just try to get a coach and I would try to uh, adhere to, there's apps, there's all kinds of stuff that you can use. There's all kinds of uh, ways you can kind of learn how to run, but just kind of quick advice. I would say you got to run about four days a week. Um, you're going to need a run that's uh, considered like a tempo run, which is just going to be faster than, um, a zone two run. A zone two is going to be, um, you stay like get, get a, uh, maybe heart rate monitor, 
check your heart rate. It should be uh, 180 minus your age-ish in that range. And you want to run like that twice a week. One time a week, you want to do the tempo run, which is just going to be slightly faster. Uh, maybe rather than, um, you know, maybe that uh, zone two run feels like 60, 70%. Now you're just going to bump up to about 80%. The tempo run is going to be a lot shorter. The zone two run is going to be longer, somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 miles. The tempo run might be half of that. And then you're going to want to have one day that's like maybe like a speed day. And then that would, you know, and, and you can just, again, like me trying to give all this to you in one uh, quick answer is too hard. So just look some of it up, uh, review it, check it out, and uh, you should be on your way. I don't have any tips for this. I have not run a marathon, but I do have a question for you and I want to know your thoughts on it because you know how sometimes like when somebody wants to, you know, they want to get in shape. So they're like, okay, I'm going to schedule a bodybuilding show. And this is the show I'm going to do. This is very similar to that. Yeah. Uh, like don't do it. Yeah. But the, <laughs> but the thing I wonder is like for like the bodybuilding show, typically it's not going to be as, as hard on your body. Right. Especially if you're not someone who's been a runner before, like trying to, you know, just lift a little bit more, you can generally be kind of safe. You know what I mean? Um, but when people are just like, I'm going to do a marathon six months from now with no running experience and their feet are weak and they have all these dysfunctional mm -hmm. gait issues, but they're going to run a marathon six weeks from now. And then they have four runs that they need to do a week. And then their knee starts fucking hurting in the ankle, but they're like, I'm going to run through it. It just feels like a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Okay. Yeah, it's a bad idea. I mean, it's not any different than um, me rushing into jujitsu. And like, I'm, you know, I tell you guys like, oh man, I went to class yesterday. And then I'm all hyped up and I'm like, I, th I did pretty good. You know, and I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to compete. And not only do I compete, but I like compete a bunch of times. And I'm trying to like, mm -hmm. and you guys are like, dude, like you, this is cool. This is amazing. I'm so proud of you. This is cool. I'm, I'm happy for you. But your luck's going to run out, yeah. you know? And I just keep going and going and going. Eventually, like, I'm just going to get, you're going to get hurt, you know? And so that's the thing. That's the unfortunate thing. I hate uh, I hate doing that to people. I hate, like, knocking down their hopes or their dreams. And I, I don't want to doubt anybody. Uh, and I never want to do that. I always want to try to encourage people. But I would rather encourage you to think about, like, if you're thinking, oh, I want to do this marathon this summer. And, you know, it's already, like, March or April or something like that. Think about maybe next summer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Play play the slower game, play the long game. Say, you know what? Well, uh, this summer, I'm going to do the 10K. There we go. Or this summer, I'm going to do the half marathon. A half marathon is still a lot to <laughs> chew off. Yes, it is. That is a lot. That is a lot of work. And I think that here's something that people don't realize. Here's something that people don't realize about a marathon. If you're not efficient at running, you're out there for longer than four hours. You're out there for long. It's an event that's four hours long. So again, using the analogy back to, because we got to always talk about jujitsu. <laughs> Imagine four hours of jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, that would suck. Oh, for, yeah. Yeah, without hardly, you know, without that much exposure to it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you go an hour, you know, a couple days a week, and, and then you try to have this one day mm -hmm. where you go against people for four hours. Like he would just be. So what I like to think about too is, not only think about the race and the idea of why you want to do it, maybe something tragic happened in your life. And maybe you're, you know, maybe you're trying to get a strong mental focus. Maybe a, a loved one passed away or something and you have a real, that's, that's incredible. And when you go and run a marathon, you'll see people like that and they'll run in groups. There's people that run for breast cancer and there's people that run for uh, all kinds of really cool things. And it's actually like very emotional, but you don't have to run a marathon for that. Mm -mm. You can run a 10K. You can run a half marathon. You could try something slightly different and you'll still get all the same uh, feelings and all the same vibe out of it. You and your ladies had an awesome night. You got dinner or you just came back from the gym and it's time for that fun time. But you look down at your willy and well, it's not working the way it should. Where's that blood flow? Well, that's where Joy Mode comes in. And I can read you these ingredients right off the bat because they're all natural ingredients. L-citrulline, arginine nitrate, panax ginseng root, and vitamin C. The thing about Joy Mode is you just slip this baby into a little bit of water, drink it in 45 minutes later, when you're getting ready to go to the pound town, you will be ready to rock. 
and you know what I mean by rock. Joy Mode's really awesome because there's a lot of things that people promote as far as sexual wellness tools, but there's a lot of weird ingredients in there. These are all natural ingredients that's going to help your own production of blood flow. Stick it in some water. 60 minutes later, you're going to be able to stick it into something else. Joy Mode's your way to go. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yes, that's over at usejoymode.com slash powerproject. And at checkout, enter promo code powerproject to save 20% off your entire order. Again, usejoymode.com slash powerproject, promo code powerproject, links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Next question from Nate Gates. And like I mentioned, guys, right now we're trying to answer all the super chats. Then we're going to come and answer as many muscle building questions and some other questions. You sound money hungry. Ah, we got to get the super chats. We got we to gotta help them out. People are paying? <laughs> They're paying. Mm -hmm. Damn. All right, let's right. answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Can Someone we... our bank account? I don't know where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have it? You don't know where it goes? I, I, Shit. I'm, all right. Pretty sure we have a bank account. Yeah. But I don't know who has access to it. <laughs> can muscle burn be an effective metric for muscle building and or work output? Hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think the muscle, what, he heats up, right? Yeah, that shit. That's what a pump is, man. Yeah. A pump is painful, mm. especially when it's a good pump. You know what I mean? And I think, like, uh, almost no matter how you do it, like, there's a lot of different ways to get to that point where the muscle will burn. So I'm thinking, like, you could do, like, a set of 30, right? And the muscles, uh, they might start to burn at rep. 22 or something, right? And the last eight reps start to, you could do a drop set. You could do a super set. You can just do a regular set and prick, pick a, a particular weight. Um, you can also do sets where you're not resting a lot, mm -hmm. which I think is probably, the, in my opinion, is probably the most effective is to do four to five good clean sets of 10 reps, have all of those reps on every single set be clean, and you're going to, what you'll end up with by the time you got past your warm up, is you're going to end up with about three or four, three or four working sets where you're getting that heat, where that muscle is kind of heating up. It's kind of hard to mimic that any other way. That's why I think that's probably the most effective. Hmm. It's also the most boring. And uh, bodybuilders are actually really good at it because they don't mind just, they're going to have chicken and broccoli, and then they're going to have chicken and broccoli. And then they're going to have chicken and broccoli and they're going to do a set of dumbbell bench press. And then they're going to do a set of dumbbell bench press. And then they're going to do a set of dumbbell bench press. <laughs> they don't care. Like they don't have to like have this crazy stimulus sometimes of like jumping from here, jumping from there and uh, making their workouts look like a CrossFit workout or something like that. Some advice I have for someone who's like newer to, to lifting. I don't know how new you are to, to lifting Nate. Um, but if you're within your first year, uh, I know a lot of people talk about like, you know, training to failure, getting a pump, feeling that burn. But when you're newer, understand that along with that, your tendons and ligaments are going to be getting stronger to be able to handle the what you're lifting. Not just your muscles getting bigger, your tendons and ligaments are going to be getting stronger to be able to handle the stress of a dumbbell when you're doing a bicep curl, et cetera. That's why I think when you're newer, it's much more beneficial to work within a higher rep range. Because if you're working with a really heavy load and you're doing sets of five or six and six is like the top, um, there's a level of strength you need to lift that weight efficiently. And when you're lifting weight that's too heavy and you're new, you're at more risk of multiple types of injuries, whether it's a ligament tear, a muscle pull, et cetera, How especially. How are you thinking? I'm, I think eight, eight to 15 to 20. I think that's a safe place for you to be able to get good stimulus for the tissue, but also not too heavy where you're, you have a lesser risk of injury. I agree. So with anywhere this between a lot eight and 20. Because a lot of times the, but sometimes when there's training partners, mm -hmm. there's, there's always somebody that's stronger than the other one. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens a lot, you would actually think that the uh, weaker guy would start to close the gap on the stronger guy, but that's not usually what happens. Usually the stronger guy just continues to get stronger and stronger. And the weaker guy, he makes progress, but he makes it slowly. Mm -hmm. And what I, my theory on this, cause this used to happen in here all the time when, or at super training all the time, mm -hmm. um, was that the uh, weaker guy just didn't get enough volume. He just could not figure out a way to get enough work. Yes. yes. Um, so like we're back and forth on bench press and uh, maybe, you know, I'm using 225 and 
you appropriately should be using 185, uh -huh. but you're like, no, I'll just use that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you get three reps, but I'm getting seven every time. Yep. And I do five sets of seven and you do five sets of three. It's a totally different outcome. You're yes. still going to get stronger. You'll still make progress, but it's not going to be the same. And you'll be kind of scratching your head all the time being like, mm -hmm. why can't I keep up with that guy? It's because you're trying to keep up with him and you need to stay in your lane a little bit more. And if you concentrated and got the reps cleanly the way the other person did, and you got the same amount of reps, you would be getting mathematically the same amount of volume. So technically, you should be getting at least similar results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I switched to what Insuma said earlier about like training for the stimulus versus like what the number was on the bar, that's when a lot of stuff changed for me. So yeah, I 100% agree. Mm. Nice. And that, what, what is your training similar now as far as rep ranges and stuff? Or are you, do you do any heavier stuff now? Uh, no, everything's been kind of the same just because like limited time. And if I'm going to like come here, I'm just going to hit that cable machine, get like a, one superset, and then we come podcast. So like the, the rep ranges and weights, I don't even, again, I don't pay attention to the weights. Did that feel good? All right, cool. Can I go heavier on the next one? Uh, maybe. Yes. Okay, that didn't feel so good. Let me just keep the same weight and do it again. And then maybe lower the reps and then maybe, you know, raise the uh, the weight. But yeah, no, it's been the same for like two years now. Nice. Do you guys care about heavy? Like, do you care about like a set of three or five on something here and there or not really? <sighs> like, like is, do you, is your heavy, is your heavy jujitsu? Like, is your heavy getting trained other places? Like we did some sprints the other day, you know? The, yeah, exactly. So that's a, that's a high intensity. Like yeah. The, I guess, you didn't, I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Like, do you guys feel for yourselves that like, appropriately do you need the intensity come from the weight room what do you think yeah i was gonna say i i miss that from the weight room a little bit like i i do miss those days of like when, when we used to do like a lot of power lifting stuff back in the day like i i do miss that feeling but i don't miss it enough to do it again so no i don't i genuinely don't care about like the weight side of things now on the jujitsu side if i leave the day and i don't feel like my my gi's not drenched from head to or neck to toe or neck to ankle <laughs> then I, I do feel like, man, maybe I didn't quite give it my all, you know, but then what happens, right? Everything that we've always talked about, it's like, well, the next session, it's like, oh man, why can't I, I'm getting smashed today. Like what's going on? Like how come nothing's clicking? It's like, oh yeah, dumbass, because you went too hard the time before. Mm -hmm. So there are times when I just, I want that feeling, right? I want to feel accomplished. I want to feel like I gave it my all. But I'm understanding that like the more I do that, the less I'm going to get out of it. So I try to calm everything down as much as possible and stay at like a, a good level instead of like skyrocketing one day and then just totally plummeting the next day. So I guess it's kind of an in-betweener. Yes, I miss it, but I'm just a little bit smarter now with how I like how I go about my training. Yeah. Heavy on certain things. Um, I like, again, I, I, I with a lot of movements I do, my focus is the quality of movement that I was getting there, right? And I'll usually stick to higher repetitions of that movement with good movement quality. But there are certain things that I will allow myself to like push the weight on because it's like, I still like to throw some weight around. So I'll still push heavy pen lays around mm -hmm. um, for like four or five reps. I'll still do that every now and then. But I'm careful with the things that I push heavy because I do notice when I do heavier work, my body... I have to, I have to wring that shit out because my body has to create so much rigidity and stiffness to do that. And I, it's good to have that ability, but I do that in spurts mm. because for my sport, my body needs the ability to stay loose and move fluidly while, while creating force. Whereas when doing heavy work, I have to be rigid and doing that too much mm. causes me to maintain too much rigidity. Mm. I don't, I can't do that. What so. do you think about maybe for other athletes? Do you think maybe for other because you already have muscle, you already have bone density. Um, I don't think someone's going to like lock up with you and be like, he's really got to work on his strength. <laughs> <laughs> so if it is another athlete that maybe does need to work on their strength, do you think um, maybe on some of the exercises that they're doing, like let's just say they're doing some curls and some overhead presses, do you think uh, on some exercises like that, they should maybe just have a set where they do a set of five or six just to feel something a little heavier? And then they kind of resume back to like a safer workout that's still going to fit the needs of the athlete. I still think, I agree with you, but I think that athletes, especially athletes where their sport isn't powerlifting, should not rush strength. I don't think powerlifters should rush strength either. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is like, if you're doing stuff within 
eight, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 reps, and you're progressing over time, you're going to be getting stronger over time. The strength gains are going to be a little bit slower than if you were consistently working threes to five rep ranges, right? But you're still going to be getting stronger. And the threes to five just lend themselves to you just utilizing an inappropriate weight. And especially if you're rushing, because there's an excitement to lifting heavy weight. And I don't, don't get me wrong. I think it's a good thing, but I think that leads a lot of us, include, and it, that's happened to myself, to making bad decisions with the amount that we load on the bar. We end up being a little bit too overzealous on one day. We're like, we want to do 225. I want to do 315 a day. You load it up and then boom, something happens because you were rushing it. You didn't gradually take yourself there. You know, even the best power lifters generally on the platform, they're still shy of what they can, oh, their, their best is. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their, their third attempt is usually going to be like that 95% and it's still a PR, yeah. right? So that's why it's just like, don't rush strength because then you're just rushing yourself towards an injury. Mm. Um, what about for you, Andrew? You think um, on some of the main movements that you like, that you enjoy um, at this moment, because you've gotten pat, you got over over the hump with jujitsu. I know there's like multiple humps to get over, <laughs> but you got over like I'm getting the shit beat out of me. I can't breathe or or do anything. Uh, phase right, mm -hmm. and uh, now you're able to lift consistently and stuff. Do you think it might uh, be advantageous for you to you know on some of these main exercises that you're doing? And maybe just like up the weight a little bit occasionally. Uh, you're, you're talking about like non like big three movements, like yeah, yeah the the movements like the current you know five okay. main movements that you currently do. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes any sense for you to be like, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna go a little heavier and see what I can push for a set or two of three reps? Yeah, it, and I still might do that once in a while, but I think the the main thing for me though is like the range of motion. So like if I'm doing like a, a you know, decline cable press instead of like worrying about like staying, you know, where, where, where you would be safely doing it, right? Like not really dropping too far back. I might let the weight pull me way far back and then maybe even open wide just so it puts me in a weird spot so I can reverse out of that. Now, when I do that, the weight's going to be like first set, like amount of weight, right? Like it's not going to be heavy because I don't want to put myself in a bad spot. But in doing that, because in jujitsu, you're, you're not, I mean, we all know this, right? Like there's so many different angles and you're not in a, in a straight line with any of it really. So I think working on, on that side of things is where I need to be focused on more than, you know, the, like the, the going heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. But if I were to do something, it would be something like a deadlift actually, like a trap bar deadlift just to get used to like being strong yeah. off of like, like a good stable position. And if case like I need to like, you know, pick someone up or whatever it may be, but just to build that overall like rigidity and just like strength and, and that sort of thing, that's the one movement that I think I will start implementing again, but it will be with the trap bar. <laughs> yeah, that's that's for sure. Yeah. And this is one of the last things I'll mention on this. Uh, I think whoever's in here, if you, if you are someone who does grappling or anything like that, um, I think doing, if you have access to heavier kettlebells, uh, start start working with kettlebells, start doing swing snatches, throwing the bell around, get stronger, throwing that weight around. I think that there's a really good transfer between being able to literally throw heavy kettlebells around and your activity in actual sport. The, the hip drive you're using, the extension, all these things that happen when you are throwing a heavy kettlebell around, I think is very, very beneficial for martial artists. So um, that's something I'm, I've been doing quite a bit of. And I think it can reap massive benefit for people. I'll be talking about that more over time. And you you do a lot of stuff that is intense. You know, like I saw you doing that hang today where you're <laughs> biting down on the towel and you got the uh, <laughs> the, the kettlebell, uh, you know, hanging from the towel and stuff. And that looks like, you know, that's not the same as pulling 675 uh, on a deadlift. But I'd imagine it feels but it probably feels challenging. And probably when you're done, it probably felt maybe a little similar to those heavy weights that you've lifted before. I started seeing, yeah, I started seeing Bill, Bill Maeda. We'll have him on the show soon. We're going to, we're going to have him via Zoom, but he's been doing a lot of uh, bite work. So lifting, you know, heavy objects, but what that does is it works on the strength of the neck and also the strength of the jaw. And people might think it looks weird, but there have been people that have lifted 600 pounds <laughs> with the strength of their jaw. The sensation that you feel after you get done doing something like that is wild. Like <laughs> all the muscles in my jaw and even in my neck are just like, what the fuck? And when I thought about it, I'm like, okay, people are going to think this is quirky and we're doing another thing. That's a fad, blah, blah, blah. But 
uh, the this whole complex there there's a lot that goes on here when strong men talk about like you know i've heard brian shaw talk about biting down he uses a mouth guard right stuff, yeah. this that that using that to be able to produce force mm. that's i think there's something to that so that's why i've started to like progress the biting stuff because like i made a neck video recently by the way and it is the most comprehensive neck video on youtube if you guys haven't seen it Sick. go check it out it's on my youtube channel um but i talked about that towards the end of that video so i've been progressing that bite stuff and i think that if you don't have any pain in your jaw, you don't have TMJ or any jaw issues, and you've done neck work before, right? You, you've you done some neck work before, you can give that a shot. But if you've never done any neck work before, don't fuck with the jaw stuff. That's just, you, you're just going to fuck yourself up for no reason. So maybe a little bit more of an advanced movement. I mm-hmm. think so, yeah, yeah. Andrew, I sent you a clip. If you can bring that up, I think Nassim is trying to get his neck to be like this guy's. <laughs> Does it need audio? Yes, 100%. <laughs> All right, well, it'll be on the, the replay. Oh, they won't be able to see it? They won't be able to hear it. They won't oh, be able to. Okay. Ah, then, then, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't hear it then. Yeah. My bad. Well, let's pull it up on the show. <laughs> All well, right. Can, yeah, never mind. <laughs> you can pull it up for a second just so we can, oh, yeah, so yeah, we can yeah. see it as part of the video or whatever. And then maybe put the link in the chat so if they want to go check that out. It's, it's fucking funny as fuck. <laughs> it's so fucking hilarious. So we'll have it on the uh, replay, but the live feed won't have it. So let me hit here. Bam. Well, bam. At least it'll be funny to us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we got. And why is there no audio? Oh, yeah, this dude. Been able to do that, or is that new? That's new. It used to be How like do you get his neck like that? Moving on. Mm-hmm. What is your biggest weakness? Two miles, 35 <laughs> minutes. Your biggest weakness is running two miles in 35 minutes? <laughs> yeah. I really plateau at the one mile. So you can run one mile in nine minutes and two miles in 35 35 minutes. minutes. And that's sort of standard every time you run? I gas after the first mile. Well, what about three miles? 16 minutes. So wait, (laughs) if you decide to run three miles, you can do it in 16 minutes. I have to know ahead of time. If you decide to run three miles, you can do it in 16 minutes. 16 minutes. minutes. But if you're doing two, it's 35. 35. And one, it's nine minutes. Does Chad have this link? (laughs) Dare I ask for? I'll send it. I've never tried it. So maybe, maybe that's your next challenge. Okay. Oh my god! It's really everywhere. What is your greatest? <laughs> Goodness, it's so weird. Yeah. What is that name of that Instagram? That's a, a weird show or whatever. It's hilarious. Is. Very and, important uh, podcast. Mm. Very important podcast or something. Very important people show. Very, yeah, guys, go follow that page. You, you'll. We want you laughing. That's that. That'll bring some joy to your day. I like asking you guys some of these questions though, because I think that. Um, I think it's important for people to understand. Like, it just really depends on your goals. Oh yeah. Um, and if you enjoy. Like if, if you, if you want to do some bodybuilding, but you happen to really enjoy every once in a while going a little bit heavy, then Mm -hmm. that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're, you know, a young kid and you're playing football and you like going heavy and stuff like that, I mean, work yourself to a point where you can handle these things so you can do the stuff that you enjoy. Um, For myself, I I tend to like want to pick up something heavy-ish, but it's heavy-ish for me now, Mm. which is like just... It's, it's nothing to like write home about or anything, but I'll just go in the gym and occasionally in between sets, I'll pick up the kettlebell in there that's heavy. And that one's like 200 pounds. So that's not some monumental deadlift, um, but I might go over to it. If I feel good, I might do it for a set of 10. Um, if I'm a little stiffer and don't feel great, I might do a couple explosive reps for sets of three or five in between doing something else. I'll throw uh, med balls around. I do think it's important to try to find things that you can do with some sort of intensity. I think that's always important. And I think even something I've noticed, something I observed over the years, the most muscular people, um, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times they can be very explosive. There's there's something to like the type two muscle fibers um, that maybe just have a uh, better propensity for hypertrophy. um, But like, John Cena comes to mind <clears throat> and Sema comes to mind. Like a lot of uh, Kenny, mm. I mean, these guys, like they, they're clearly very explosive. They're clearly very fast and they're able to put on a lot of muscle mass. So it's just something to think about. I think there's an important uh, element there to trying to keep some sort of athleticism and also try to keep uh, some pretty good intensity with, it doesn't have to always be with a heavy weight, mm-hmm. um, but it could be with an object. It could be, with a farmer's carry, it could be with uh, throwing a med ball. I think all those types of things are really valuable for anybody, any type of lifter or bodybuilder or athlete. Yeah, no, that's extremely important. If you guys want to join in on the conversation and potentially win some prizes, hit up our Discord below. 
It's an awesome community of over 3,000 people. And we go live every single week. We notify you there. So join the Discord so you can join up on these lives and we can answer all of your questions. Next question from Hayden Pratt. Any tips on grip strength and forearm size? Mm. Yeah, grip strength is a grip strength sometimes is a tough one for some people. I guess it would depend on like, you know, if you're if you're trying to build your grip because you're trying to build your forearms, um, that's a little bit different. But like what we did in powerlifting, a huge thing that we did was just we did a lot of double overhand deadlifting to help build the grip. And then we just hold the weight at the top. We also, there was a lot of guys that used the under over grip. So I would have people use under over grip both ways so mm-hmm. that they learned how to do it uh, both styles. So that way um, they were building their hands and their biceps up uh, in a similar way. And then um, a couple other things that were really effective, believe it or not, just hanging from a chin up bar is super effective for grip mm-hmm. um, and really trying to work on being able to build that capacity up. And the heavier you are, um, the kind of almost better it works because a lot of times if you're heavier, you might suck at it for a while, but the amount of uh, grip that you need to have uh, will start to build up pretty uh, pretty rapidly. Um, utilizing thicker bars, and there's, uh, what are those uh, things that people put on the dumbbells? Fat grips, right? Mm-hmm. Fat grips. There's things like that that um, are kind of real easy solutions to help with grip strength. Um, and then there's all kinds of other things you can do. We have some of those hand grippers and... Uh, things like that to build the forms. What's this guy that we have, that little <laughs> orange thing? Um, that thing's pretty wild. I forgot uh, what that thing's It's called. like an arm wrestling arm wrestling thing. But I would also advise, you know, check out some stuff that the arm wrestlers do. Like you want big ass forearms. Those guys do a lot of crazy exercises for their forearms. Mm-hmm. Farmer's walks, I think are great. Um, not only does it work your grip, your forearms, your traps, it's a good overall movement, um, but you can do farmer's walks with fat grips. That's also something you could do. Obviously you can do wrist curls. So, you know, you can YouTube wrist curls, just take a dumbbell, you can put it over a bench, boom, 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 boom. And then if you have something like a, a mace or something like that, you can do curls in this direction. So hoo, 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 and two, two. Right? You can do that for high repetitions with high frequency. You can do that maybe two to three times a week. That would be helpful. Just be mindful. Uh, pay attention to the way your elbows and your wrists feel over mm. time. Um, I think it'd be a good idea to, what is that tool that we have? That that fucking myofascial release tool? The, the oh, roller? Yeah, the eight, the, the, whatever roller. Eight yeah. Roller or something. Roller eight. <laughs> oh, I, that's very good. It's on Rogue. Rogue has it. I forget what it's called. When you start working your forearms a lot, the tissue here, all these tissues are going to start getting bigger, tighter, and then you're going to start, you might start feeling some pain in the forearms or even some potential wrist pain. That roller eight thing, that is something that's been so clutch for me, especially after Ian Danny came and he found that ball of tissue that was like locked up in my wrist. That's really good. No, we don't have a code and we're not sponsored by them, but I love that thing to roll out the wrist. Obviously, every runner should have that too. For their legs? Oh, God, yeah. For your <laughs> shins and calves and stuff. The thing's incredible. I use mm. it all the time. I use it um, probably since I bought it. I probably have, have used it at least once a week since I bought it, which was probably like a year and a half ago or so. Damn. I've been using that on my forearms all the time. And if you're someone who uh, competes in jujitsu, that right there, that bitch, that is the best thing to use in between rounds of competition because Ooh. what happens is guys death grip everything. Yeah. So at, most guys, when they come out, they're fucking, mm. they're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So well, I brought that to my, uh, our last tournament and uh, I was rolling out. Everybody's I was all stuck. Yeah. Yeah. That thing right there. That's, that's the hack. Mm. That's the fucking Damn. hack. Yeah. On, on the, uh, on the last live we were talking about, I forgot what it was exactly. I think it was another forearm question, but I was just saying like, if you're going to do your, your bicep curls, just switch to a hammer grip oh, yeah. because that's going to build the brachialis muscle. And mm-hmm. that's just going to add more, more size to the uh, forearm area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool. Next question from John Blade Music. Thoughts on 531 program for beginners. Looking to get as strong as possible while ensuring balance between sides. 531 is great. Uh, It's written by Jim Wendler. He wrote it probably a good, almost maybe 15 years ago now. And uh, it has some of the West Side Barbell principles. Um, even the uh, the wording that he has in the book is is excellent, I think, because he wants to see people be successful with their with their lifts. And the basics of it are: you do five reps one week, three reps the next, one rep the next week, and it's usually of of the same exercise, 
So that way you can actually see that you're um, able to lift a little bit more weight. Not It's obvious you'd be able to lift more weight because you're doing less repetitions. Um, but after you kind of cycle through this multiple times, your sets of five will get better. Your sets of three will get better. Your sets of one will get better. You'll just get stronger overall. And I think it's a really great introduction, probably the best introduction I've ever really seen uh, into some strength training. Yeah, it's a great program. I did it early on. Um, I did it a few years after I already started lifting. So I think that having that base of hypertrophy work helped me take advantage of 531. Um, so just make sure, because I remember when I did 531, I'm assuming that Wendler probably updated the program to add more volume in. But when I did it, there wasn't a lot of higher volume stuff in it. So if you, he probably updated it, but if not, try to see if you can get in some good volume work, get in some sets of some stuff like bodybuilder work after your, you know, main compound movements um, to help build some muscle. That'll be beneficial. Yeah. Being bigger is going to help you to be stronger. So there's a lot of crossover between the two. And if you <laughs> predominantly only power lift, um, you could potentially gain some strength. Uh, but then you might not really look strong. And maybe mm -hmm. that is your goal. You know, if your goal is to look stronger um, as well as just be strong, then that might be something you want to consider is adding in some hypertrophy. All right. Now, there's two more Super Chats. I'm going to go up and get to these other questions. Thank you, guys. Um, <clears throat> it's a running question. Mark, I want to pull in, I want to pull in running back in. Mm. I want to pull running back in. How many times a week can I add without hurting muscle gains? One mile at 15 minutes per day, slow enough? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, it just depends on, you know, where, where you're at with your current ability to run. Running every day, um, it's just easy to get carried away with running every day. So I think I think once you start taking on the mantra of doing anything every day, I think you start to run into issues. Um, for myself, when it comes to movement, that's an agreement I have with myself that it's okay to do like movement every day and or exercise. Uh, but I don't want to necessarily commit to lifting every day and I don't necessarily want to commit to running every day um, because you just sort of lock yourself into that box and um, doing, you know, uh, lifting when you're still hurt or uh, running when you have a slight injury, mm -hmm. <laughs> just because you're lifting every, just because you're running every day, now you're committed to doing this, even though your knees slightly hurt. It's just not smart. So um, I would say I wouldn't advise necessarily like running every day, um, but allowing for, you know, some walking and some movement, some lifting and stuff like that every day is not a bad idea. How many times a week can you run? I would say maybe start out with like two or three and see how that goes. Um, if a 15 minute mile pace is modest and uh, slowish for you, um, I would do that once a week. And then one time a week, I would have it at least one time a week. I would run, um, just a little faster than that. Maybe see if you could, uh, do something that's, uh, at just a little higher intensity. Yeah. And I think, uh, the higher intensity stuff might actually help maintain muscle versus doing longer distance. It's very stuff. true. So cool. Very true. Maybe look into doing a little bit of uh, hill work, some sprints or something like that on a hill might be a good idea. Yeah. It's going to build a lot of muscles. It's going to build up your hamstrings and your calves. and You'll feel it. You'll feel it in your feet, everything. Just don't do it at 100%. <laughs> okay, please. Just don't do it at 100%. Do it nice and easy. Yeah. All right. Last super chat from Darian Donaldson. Minimum effective dose for strength plus size gains with jujitsu. Uh, Darian, I would suggest, uh, minimum effective is dose probably twice per week. I don't know how many days a week you're training jujitsu right now. Um, but if you're doing jujitsu for two or three sessions, then two to three times a week of lifting is going to be perfectly fine. Um, if you're newer to jujitsu, I wouldn't suggest trying to lift four or five days a week just because jujitsu is going to be beating your body up so much. You're doing so many new things. Um, but two to three days a week, just make sure also that you're eating enough food because this is one of the biggest things that I think people that start jujitsu and lifting forget uh, when they're doing both. Like you are burning a lot of calories in jujitsu. You're going to be burning quite a few calories in the gym. You need to fuel yourself so that you're not just draining the tank. So eat enough protein eat enough calories, make sure you eat enough food to grow. Cause you can grow, but most people don't eat enough to grow when they're doing both of these activities. So two to three days. And Sima, what are your thoughts on uh, jujitsu and train like gym training on the same day? I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, if you're, 
new, that's going to be a bit harder to do. It's just going to be harder. But I do that, but I'm experienced with it. So I'm efficient with jujitsu, so I can go in there and I don't need my whole gas tank to be able to be have an effective training session. But when you're newer, um, it's tough. And who knows what your schedule is like, maybe because of the way your schedule's set up and where, you know, the time you work, where jujitsu is, where the gym is, maybe your only option is sometimes getting the gym and jujitsu on the same day. And if that's the case, I would suggest doing gym training first and jujitsu second. The reason why I say that is because you don't want to be fatigued lifting weights in the gym. You, And of course, you don't want to be fatigued doing jujitsu either. But in, in that setting, you can really just toggle down your intensity well. You can toggle down your intensity in the gym too. But I, I think that you have more chances of injuring yourself with weight versus when doing drills with another person or doing some sparring stuff, you know? So just, just be mindful of that. Um, and if you're going to do them on the same day, don't have your gym workout be way too intense before you go to jujitsu. Mm. Jiu don't kill yourself and then go to jujitsu expecting to have a decent session. When I do both in a day, I'll have a decent gym workout, but I'm not fucking dead. I mm. still have some energy to go roll. So do enough so that when you go roll, you still have energy to have a decent session of jujitsu. How about okay, you got some uh, like necessities for like somebody that is going to train on on both days? Like I know we talk about electrolytes often. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that's already like cemented in everyone's thoughts when it comes to supplements or whatever. But like, how about like diet? Like, I mean, uh, calories for that day. Like, what should they be paying attention to? Also, in regards to like the the intensity of the workout before the jujitsu session, the, the, the hydration. Is there anything else that like you should just really like, hey, like don't overlook this? I think you mentioned the first really important thing is electrolytes. If you're going to the gym sweating and you're getting a workout in or you choose to do jujitsu first, you sweat a fuck ton, <laughs> you want to make sure you have electrolytes in you. Cramp. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, for most people, you do want to make sure you have enough calories in you. So like have some food before your gym workout, have some food after before you go to jujitsu, especially if you're newer to this. When you're more experienced, then you know how you're going to feel with a certain amount of food. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, but but make sure you're well fed beforehand. And one thing is never, a lot of people, and I've done this before, um, you know, you can come to the gym, you can just kind of start working out, right? Don't do jujitsu cold. Anybody who's new here, do not do jujitsu without warming your body up adequately. That's the greatest way to tweak your rib, get a groin injury, mm -hmm. tweak something when you're trying to grapple with somebody in different planes of motion cold. That's just a, that's just a recipe to, to injure yourself. So mm -hmm. just never do jujitsu cold. If you came late for the warmups, warm the fuck up before you start sparring with mm -hmm. people. It's just not a good, good idea. Purple belts. Yeah. Yeah, we do that. I've done it. <laughs> and I think uh, whether you're talking about lifting and running or lifting and any other combination of things, I think as we always share with you is all this stuff is going to take a long time. Um, you're going to suck for a while at stuff. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it goes. So there's really no rush. Um, the idea of somebody like, you know, wanting to train five days a week, we understand it. We get it. And yes, it could be done because you could spread out the exercises and stuff. Um, but mo more than likely, uh, if you're getting yourself to a gym, once you get inside the gym, you're going to overdo it. <laughs> and then you're going to be compromising the two things back and forth. And, and Seema and I have talked about this and we've all talked about this a bunch on the show about, you know, compromising things with the things that you love. You know, you're doing, you're doing the thing to its own detriment, which mm -hmm. is just like brutal. You're doing jujitsu like you like. Oh man, I just want to get better. And it's like, just stop going. <laughs> stop. Like just just knock it off, man. Like you go you go too much. You yeah. think about it too much. You're. It's a physical and a mental endeavor at the same time. It's like it's physical, uh, and there's like puzzle pieces that you're trying to solve all at the same time. So I don't think we realize uh, how strenuous it is. Um, this is kind of like unrelated, but it just made me think of this. Is um. When when a child is really young, like when you have a baby, mm -hmm. your, your baby, everything to the baby is new. That's why the baby's so damn tired all the time. Like even just with like a, a little kid or a, or a baby, um, taking them to the grocery store could like wipe them out, even if they didn't really even walk. Yeah. But everything, the, all the noise, the smells, the lights, everything is a lot for them. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind when anything's new for you, even as an adult, it's way more taxing than what you think. 
you guys remember how taxing it would be sometimes to be at those trade shows yeah. and to have and to have 75 different conversations like in a day like it just whoosh it just like you know knock you way back it's because it's novel it's because you don't do it very often and so anytime anything's new or there's like a lot of excitement like you can't go to these shows and and not be excited. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. can't go to jujitsu. You can't be in the middle of a lifting session and not get excited by it. And so you're more than likely probably going to do too much. We don't recognize. It might not feel like much sometimes. It might be like, oh, I can go again. Oh, oh no, I can handle it. And it's like, well, maybe you should just <laughs> pump the brakes here and there a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've. Pretty much every expo that we've ever gone to, like I get, I come back sick. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, it could be because I'm around so many people. But I think the what it was is just I got no yeah. sleep and was on my feet all day and yelling and talking. But same thing will happen to me too if I go too hard in jujitsu and in the gym. Like I don't recover, and then I like no, I don't want to be a bitch. You know, I got to keep going, and then I'm getting sick. You know, like the immune system drops or whatever it may be, and that's definitely going to slow all of the progression down. So yeah, I, you just got to listen to the body. Yeah. You're probably wondering why am I wearing these glasses? Well, it's because I'm being bathed in blue light and blue light isn't necessarily bad. There's blue light in the sun, but if you're in your office, if you're indoors, if you're in front of a screen during the daytime, it's not a great idea to have your eyes being bathed by blue light all day long. That's why EMR Tech, a company that we've partnered with, has blue light daytime glasses and blue light blocking evening glasses. These glasses right here are meant for you to wear during the daytime when you're in front of screens, etc. But if you're outside, take the glasses off and get the natural sunlight. And if you're at home in the evening when sun sets and you need to be in front of the TV or you need to be in front of your computer or on your phone, these glasses are the ones to get. They also have the best red light therapy devices on the market. If you stand in front of any of EMR Tech's red light therapy devices, you will actually feel how much stronger the output of the red light is on those devices versus any of the competitors. They also have some of their smaller red light devices like their Fire Wave, Fire Dragon, and Fire Storm. And then if you want to get some of their bigger panels, they have their Fire Hawk, which is their biggest panel, and the Inferno panel. These are literally the best red light therapy devices on the market. And if you want to save on them, Andrew, how can they do that? Yes, you got to head over to emrtech.com. That's E-M-R dash tech, T-E-K dot com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Again, that's emrtech.com, promo code POWERPROJECT. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. All right. Valerie Page. That's a good question. Valerie Page. I love Valerie. She's awesome. Can you build good muscle with only body weight exercises? In example, squats, push-ups, pull-ups, etc. Also, is creatine really that beneficial in muscle growth? <laughs> huh? Creatine, yeah. Creatine. Body weight exercises are amazing. You know, how big can you get with just body weight exercise? I have no idea. No, have you seen those like, okay. Well. I know there's like calisthenic type people <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What, in Zuma? <laughs> what? You, Yo, what, you what? See, what? what? Uh, on YouTube, there's a sect <laughs> of the fitness that's like just these black dudes that love calisthenics. It's mainly <laughs> a lot of black guys. And I haven't seen any other channels. But... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just, I'm saying. just saying. But no, like <laughs> you're um, 250 pounds in calisthenics. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's I Nigerian. He's okay, I get it. I get it. No, but Gabo Saturno, there's an example. He's like, uh, he's Spanish or something. He's Hispanic. <laughs> he's very large. And he mainly does calisthenic stuff. Yes, you can gain muscle um, from calisthenics work. I think it's actually really good to do. I'm trying to do more calisthenics myself because I'm, I want a better uh, body weight to strength ratio. I want because I, I believe I can have that capacity. But I think that's also going to transfer well to anything. Because like you see how strong like rock climbers are. There we go. Is that Gabo? Yeah. yeah. Like, Gabo's awesome. I've never heard of this. Yeah. He's, you got you to go to his Instagram, bro. Like okay. um, he's, uh, well, not right. I'm just saying like, if you check out his Instagram, he has a lot of good information on calisthenic types work. He also has good programs on I his website. I think it's website. amazing. I think it's uh, a really huge key that's really not talked about much. Um, in terms of like people are always talking about like things to do for longevity. Mm -hmm. I think your strength to weight ratio is huge. And now you can lift weights to build strength to weight ratio, but a great way to see what kind of strength to weight ratio you have is to try to perform some calisthenics and recognize how terrible you probably are at them. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I think uh, the frustrating thing about calisthenics is that it's not like lifting weights mm -hmm. where the progression, the progression isn't perfectly linear when lifting, like, you know, there's stall periods. 
but the progression of calisthenics is much slower. You actually really need to do regressions for a while. So that means like if you're bad at pull-ups, you need to do banded pull-ups for a bit. Pan banded dips, you know, because like sometimes, um, pe- you know, you, you'll want to do like, oh, I want to do some dips. And then you'll do like five. And you're like, fuck, that beat me up too much. Mm. Do banded dips for high volume. Over time, you're going to be able to do normal dips. And then over time, you're going to be able to do weighted dips. Yeah. But the progression is slow. Um, although I think calisthenics are great because you can just have equipment at your house. It's easy mm-hmm. to have two dip bars from like base blocks or something like that and do this work at home. I think it's beneficial for everybody. It's worth it, no matter what athlete you are definitely build a lot of muscle mass. Um, I guess, you know, the, the one thing would sometimes is like, well, why not utilize both? Cause we know that weight training has such a great impact. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we just know that like a lot of these things have, um, they're really effective, you know, yeah. going out and doing some sprints is really effective. So maybe you should do them every once in a while or find some sort of way to sprint on something, whether it's a machine or you go outside and sprint. Um, but it, you know, calisthenics are, amazing. I think that most people should probably try to figure out a way to incorporate more of them. They're probably the only like calisthenics I can kind of think of that I do are probably like a lunge, a squat, I guess a pull up you can kind of count in there, push ups. I should probably figure out ways to do like a little bit more, but I, I think they're great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Good question. Very good question. All right. Now, Nicholas Bredian, do you think one could transfer weighted? Oh, before I continue on this question, I want to make sure everybody knows. Uh, again, we're giving away some good stuff at the end of this Q&A. If you are a winner, because last week, we got three p- people got their shit, but two people didn't message me on Discord. So I'm still waiting on two of y'all. Um, but if you win, be part of the Discord. My Discord username is Transima. Message me your name, your email address, and your physical address, right? So I can get you your shit. If well, you're not, not really on trend, right? It's just a nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Can't talk about it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not on trend. I just, I, I, it was either Smokey or somebody who called me trend I was like, oh, I kind of like that. It sounds good. It, it kind of name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good name. Um, yeah. So make sure guys. All right. Now, Nicholas Bradian, do you think one could transfer weighted pull up, weighted push ups on parallettes pronated to benching? or at least improve slash supplement benching progress. Do either of you wow. two do any body weight related exercises? Okay, so this That's kind like of ties open in. shoulder way up, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, weighted push-ups on parallels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it goes all the way down. I think that could definitely be beneficial. That sounds like a great movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know how much it might, you know, I don't know how much it will help your bench, but like normally when you do extra ranges of motion, it usually helps. You know, you think of a uh, deadlift, Sometimes people will do partial range of motion deadlifts, but sometimes people will do um, a deficit deadlift, right? Where the, I've seen people deadlift like heavy weights um, almost right off their shoelaces. They got such a deficit going. So um, extra range of motion is is usually pretty valuable uh, all the way to the point where, you know, years back, it was pretty popular to utilize a cambered bar. There's a cambered bench press bar and they had like the, the center of it was sort of dug out. So you would go an extra like two, three inches uh, lower and um, pushing and pressing and pulling from um, spots that are like, you just don't have good leverage uh, will will always assist with uh, making you stronger. Yeah. Plus it's going to be great for the health of your shoulders. You know what I mean? So it might not directly increase your bench strength immediately, mm-hmm. but if it helps your shoulders and these muscles, if th- these, if this area is healthier, well, you're going to be able to do what you love for a longer period of time. So. Why I don't not? know whatever happened to the cambered bar. It's great. Because like, you know, when you, use, uh, when you use dumbbells, you know, your arms will only go down kind of so far um, depending mm. on your mobility. But the cambered bar <laughs> is a little more dangerous because it kind of shoved you into that <laughs> position because your your hands are fixed. Yeah. Uh, but man, it felt good. It was a really good stretch. Yeah, I, I could never keep the, uh, the weight stable. It would always swing on me. Yeah. It scared the shit out of me. I always thought I was going to end up like the bar have have the bar just fucking just mm. get rid of all my teeth mm. <laughs> who needs them man who fucking needs teeth gains bro by the way if you guys haven't it'd be it, if you don't floss every day <laughs> right <laughs> and i'm not saying this judging anybody because i used to not floss every day i was going to say younger. this is something new that you found out <laughs> no no no, no, <laughs> no holy shit there's a lot of steak in there <laughs> dude there is though <laughs> there is um but, but it's supposed to be there. I mean, that's what the carnivore guys would say. I'm kidding. Oh, <laughs> like, okay, no good. way. Good. We're supposed to like rot in there. 
That's, that's good for you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It gives you extra calories later on, right? That that's the goal. Helps that's the gut the microbiome. <laughs> No, when I was Go a kid, back to your pitch here. I didn't take no. Listen, I didn't take flossing seriously when I was a kid. Never had a cavity though. Um, but the, Huberman had an episode recently on teeth, and we actually had an episode talking about teeth stuff years ago or mm-hmm. whatever. But just uh, the the it can massively affect your sleep, your brain, a bunch of shit. Mm. Make sure to floss really? your shit. Yeah, wow. yeah. That's why it's actually a pretty interesting episode to check out. Mm. So um, the uh, plaque that builds up on your teeth is the same plaque that builds up. In your arteries. Oh, fuck. Wow. So whatever, you know, if you can get rid of that just by picking some shit out of your teeth with some floss, then mm-hmm. that sounds like a pretty good victory to me. Don't neglect it, guys. Yeah, I, I water I floss I got like a weird spot, too, that always has like meat in it. It's disgusting. Every time. Yeah. Dude, I, I am amazed at how much uh, stuff comes out when I water floss with a water pick. Same. I'm just like, dude, like, did any of it make it past? Like, it's all still here. Like, there's at least eight ounces of steak in the, you know, in the sink or whatever. That's disgusting. It is really gross. And the, 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 <laughs> holy shit. The, the funny thing is, <laughs> you look down, you're like, oh my god. Yeah, no, I can like literally like like phew, like oh. <laughs> But when I went, I to love the, how disgusting everything I is. Know. I really do. Like it creeps me out, but it's yeah amazing too. When I went to the dentist, <laughs> oh. when I went to the dentist a couple of years ago, <laughs> you know they they they, 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 <laughs> they track shit right. Like they track like everything. Okay, his teeth is like right here or whatever, uh-huh. and my gum line was like right here or whatever. And then when I went back the next time, they're like double checking everything. They're like that doesn't make any sense. And like, what are you doing? Like, what are you talking about? They're like, your mouth is significantly healthier than it was last time, and it shouldn't be that. Like, that. What was should, the change? I didn't change anything. I just kept water flossing every day. Wow. And I told them that, and they're like, No. What What else are you doing? I'm like, Dude, that's it. Mm. And they're like, Well, water flosser doesn't work that well. And I'm like, Yeah, it does. Because obviously, that's that's working. That's all I'm doing. Like, No, you need to use actual floss. That's the only way to actually get in there. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I don't use floss. I just use water. And he got, like, my dentist got mad at me. You know what? On that Huberman episode, he, because he mentioned he talked to four people, he, they were all like, water floss. Really? Yeah. Sick. Okay, yeah. so, my, so my dentist was just bought in yeah. like, <laughs> by big floss. <laughs> Two more things. Two more things. We had a guy on the show on like episode four something who came and talked about like how mouthwash mm-hmm. is fucking up your mouth's microbiome, like mm-hmm. Listerine and shit. Same shit that was mentioned on that episode. So make sure you're not using an antiseptic mouthwash that kills all the shit in your mouth. Good job, Huberman, catching up five years later. Yeah, we've been on the game, bro. (laughs) But one thing I didn't know was that you should brush your gums. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, so like actually that's good for your gum health if you use a soft brush and Mm -hmm. brush your gums. So I didn't know. Nice and easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do it nice and easy. Same with the the, the toothpaste too. You you can just kill everything with like a regular crest. Like fucking, yeah. Don't, yeah. don't use that acid. Yeah. Yeah, my wife's finally got into all that stuff too. Like it took her like a long time of me being weird. Or Wait, what? Be like, oh, I'm going to buy this soap. Oh, I'm going to buy oh, this right. toothpaste. Yeah. I'm going to buy this, you know. Um, yeah, I just, try, I, I don't know. I, I don't always know, you know, like there still could be shit in the other thing that I'm buying. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's like information changes all the time. But, but you're trying. I just try to make the attempt. I don't know how to stay away from like uh, fucking plastics and 5G or whatever the fuck, but I just try my best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Do it where I can. There we go. All right. Cool. Now, uh, we've got another super chat from Luis Arguez. I've said that wrong for sure, but all right. <laughs> Sound good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And Seema, what's your approach to maximizing learning jujitsu techniques? Do you watch BJJ instructionals? What's your approach to learning from them? Luis, okay. So, there's a few things. The first thing is when I was newer to jujitsu, I made sure not to watch bad jujitsu. Um, and that was just something for me because I, like, I, I truly believe that you can learn in a lot of ways. And I'm a, I believe I, I can learn a lot visually. So uh, when I watch people do shit, that's bad technique. It's kind of like my mind kind of records it and I'll recreate it. And that's not good. So I watched a lot of good jujitsu, high level jujitsu. Um, so watch matches because I think that if you watch matches of like, let's say that you're trying to work fucking uh, half guard, right? And that's something you're trying to get better at. Find a grappler who does a lot of half guard in the gi, like Mason Fowler. 
He's a half guard player in the gi, and you can watch his matches and see what he does. If half you're trying guards to, like one leg over kind of deal. Half right? guard is like one like we're we're kind of scissored in between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank half, you for using. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one guy is on his back, and the other guy has uh, one leg one leg in between the other guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a yeah. You're scissored. Yeah, Mike Isertel loves half guard because he's big and can't move. He likes scissors. Um, <laughs> 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 I love you, Mike. Uh, if you're someone who like if you like collar sleeve, right? Uh, watch a lot of Nicholas Mirigali, right? So you can see these guards in action. Um, and then obviously set up a game plan in your training so that you can be like, okay, today my intention is to get collar sleeve on my opponent and I'm just going to work this guard today. Have intention towards your training sessions, trying to work specific guards on specific days so you get that training in. Uh, and you can set up specific training in this way too because sometimes when you spar with people, you find that you'll never get in those positions. So if you're a lower belt rolling with an upper belt, you can ask them, hey, can I start an X guard or can I start in half guard or can I start in collar sleeve and can we work from here? More than likely, you're going to be willing so you can get your reps in of working that specific guard. Um, I do think instructionals are really good. Uh, and I do take advantage of watching instructionals, especially uh, on days, some days that I train, some days that I don't. But I I, I think watching a lot of the jujitsu and the ways that you want to roll is going to help you take those and roll with them in class. So if you're newer, be very mindful of the jujitsu you watch. At least I was. Now, like, I'm not as nitpicky with that although I kind of still am like if I see like white belt competitions unless it's somebody that like <laughs> <laughs> is part of our school I'll kind of just like look away <laughs> is it That's is so it good funny. to uh is it good to maybe watch like let's say that you have some limitations let's say you're not super mobile is it good to try to like find some other people that maybe have those limitations or they're a much shorter athlete is it good to watch like the shorter guy or the heavier guy um, just That's in awesome, the, dude. Yeah, just in the beginning. Because you're like, I kind of look like that guy. I kind of move like that guy. And mm -hmm. I should probably, but he's pretty proficient. Looks like he's winning. He's doing really well. Uh, yeah. Maybe I should kind of click on his Instagram and follow him. There's a few ways to look at that. I think the biggest factor that you mentioned actually is like the height thing, right? Mirigali is 6'3 with very long legs. There are certain things that he does that I've tried to replicate. And because my legs are so muscular, like my lasso does not get as deep <laughs> as cleanly as his does. So I do a half lasso, right? I adjust. If you're someone who's stockier, right, and you're like 5'7", five, 5'8", five, 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 you probably want to watch the lightweights or somebody who's, who's a bit stockier, right? Um, so you can see what is their game like because your jujitsu game does increase with the stuff that you're able to do the lengthier you are for your weight class, right? Because if you're like somebody who's uh, in Andrew's weight class, you're 180, but you're like six foot. <laughs> right? There's a lot of stuff that you can do versus the 180 pound guy that's 5'3". Mm -hmm. The 5'3 the guy is going to be playing half guard mm -hmm. all day, every day. Um, so you, you're right in that sense. But I also think if you're not mobile and that's your restriction, watch the people that are doing well with the things that you want to do because your mobility is something you can change, right? It's better to change your mobility and have better jujitsu than have less mobility and have a very limited jujitsu game because now... Because of that, your opponent knows what you're going to do. <laughs> and if that one A game doesn't work because you're limited on your range of motion, shit, game over. Yeah. And then so for me, you know, even still to this day, but when I was like really, really new, I would watch stuff. I would watch uh, instructionals. I'd watch stuff on Instagram. And, you know, again, it's like kind of like relearning or learning a new language. Mm. I couldn't speak that damn language. Yeah. And then in, in time, stuff started making sense. But what I had what I had to do was I would have to like screen record something so I could watch it on my phone in super slow motion. Still do it. I do that. I shit. have to just go frame by frame to be like, okay, what what is his left foot doing there? Like, okay, oh, okay. So he has the collar on this side, and then he switched to this side when he went to the attack. Got it. And so like I had to really just sig like by segment by segment, just like make sense and chain things together because when you watch it all one in one take. It's like, dude, you, you miss so much. But yeah. when you go little by little and like, oh, okay, now, and then things started to click. And there have been a couple of times where like, I'll look at something and it's like, oh, that was the thing that I was just looking at. Like, there it is. And it's like, ah, sick. So that, mm -hmm. and then of course, asking a shit ton of questions. Oh my gosh. If there's an upper belt that you're friends with or whatever it may be, hey, dude, I really want to work this collar sleeve guard and see my after class. Can we work this? And yeah. then film that. And then, so I have that stuff to reference all the time now. So questions and slowing down when you're watching stuff. Yeah. I think of the age of jujitsu that we're in is really dope because like guys like Toby or um, guys that we know who were black belts back then, 
they didn't have the resources to watch all the things like we do now. Like they had to pay for this Budo video thing so that they could see specific matches. But now everything's on YouTube. Everything's on instructionals. You can find all of this stuff. And that's why people are like doing wild shit at tournaments. That's why you see guys who are like purple belts, brown belts, black belts. They're literally like, the fuck you're not. The fuck? Because people are actually just watching and doing. Mm. So people are advancing much faster. So it's, 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 it's dope. You can learn a lot these days. Yeah, I was. I love this. Uh, I don't even know what it's called, but maybe it's a flower sweep or pendulum sweep. I uh-huh. think that's what it is. Toby showed it to me like a, a year ago or so. Yeah. And every time I do it, I just go, Toby Staley. And I just yeah. do it because <laughs> I get so hyped up for, for when I do it. <laughs> All right. Next question from Nate Gates. What's the deal with BFR, a.k.a. blood flow restriction? Uh, it could be utilized for injuries. You know, it could be utilized just to get a pump in a certain area that maybe you have a hard time, you know, driving blood to. Uh, I think it's a, a good method, but um, I personally don't use it maybe just out of like, it can be inconvenient. Yeah. If I do hurt something though, I will voodoo floss something and I will move around like that's, I've been doing that for years and that has always been very effective. Mm -hmm. It's great if you're injured, you injured your elbow, injured your knee. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to maintain and still potentially build some muscle. You know what I mean? You can get away with using extremely light loads Mm -hmm. while restricting that area. There's a lot of cool blood flow restriction guys on YouTube where you can like, um, you know, find that stuff. I think there's a, there's some bands called BFR bands that are pretty solid for mm-hmm. both for restriction. Cause I mean, I know we used to just use fucking uh, <laughs> wrist wraps. Yeah. Or, gangster rap or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and that <laughs> shit, that can get, that can get sketchy. Yeah. So um, yeah, but it, it, it's great to use, especially when injured. All right. Okay. Let's see. Where? Oh, oh, James Gallegos, best muscles to target to look bigger, quicker. Yeah. Well, there's, I, yeah, I would say like what comes to mind is like when people have a good structure of their back mm. because it seems to kind of push everything else out. Um, so while you might get some good results or you might see something quickly by kind of training your chest or your arms, I think ultimately having a bigger back. When you think about people that are big, I think when someone's like, when you're like, shit, man, that guy's big. He almost always has a big back. It's like kind of hard to avoid. Yeah, the back. I love back training. Mm -hmm. But exactly, yeah, yeah, the back. Don't neglect your legs. I mean, (laughs) but there's pants. There's pants, but it's 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 (laughs) yeah, it's tough if you're walking around like this and then your legs are, (laughs) you know, it's like it's not good look. Yeah, it's not good. The ladies like the legs too. They girls love booty. Girls Mm. love booty just as much as we do. Right. So, yeah. Well, maybe yeah. not just as much. No, definitely no, not just as not much. Yeah. But they like it. They like it. Train your neck. Mm. I'm going to plug that. Yo, yo. The neck, a, a nice thick neck makes the boys go crazy. <laughs> it brings them all to the yard. It brings the boys to the yard. <laughs> <laughs> makes you look more substantial. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that. And then, I mean, I wish I could say traps, but I feel like no matter how hard I've tried to train traps, they, I just can't get them to get as big as I want. Um, although they have gotten bigger. They've gotten bigger. But yeah. the, the one thing that I will say that just helps everything. And when I focused on this muscle group for like a year and a half straight, mm-hmm that's when I started getting compliments of like, dude, you're actually, you're looking jacked right now. Your penis. Yes. No, my shoulders. I, oh, yeah. I, because it, like it, can, like what mm-hmm. Mark was saying, like it just gets you wider and then you have that wider frame and now it's like everything else, you know, just looks better. But yeah, that was the thing for me. Like I was like, dude, my shoulders, not where I want them to be. And I focused on them just nonstop for like a year straight. And I finally made some progress. And then that's when the compliments started coming in. The craziest thing is just being like lean, I know we're talking about like being mm-hmm. big or looking big, but you'll look big when you're lean. Your shoulders popped out more. It's not like you didn't have shoulders before, but you got a little leaner. Mm-hmm. And then now you have like a shadow and a nice line of where your shoulder muscles are mm-hmm. going into like the tricep. And that just looks awesome. And you see that and you're like, this guy's jacked. You know, it, <laughs> yeah. it makes someone look way more jacked. So um, I don't think it's great for everyone all the time to like try to be skinny, but uh being a little leaner can sometimes make you look a little bigger. Yep, yep. Oh, this is a statement from Matt Reynolds just saying, hey, great job, Andrew, on the Savans podcast. Hey, Andrew was just on Savans pod. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, so that episode's there. Y'all should check it out. It was fun. 
A constant thing that's been beneficial for all of our health has been intaking enough protein, but also intaking quality protein. And that's why we've been partnering with Good Life Proteins for years now. Good Life not only sells Piedmontese beef, which is our favorite beef, and the main reason why it's our favorite is because they have cuts of meat that have higher fat content, like their ribeyes and their chuck eyes, but they also have cuts of meat like their flat iron. Andrew, what's the macros on the flat iron? Yeah, dude. So the flat iron has 23 grams of protein, only two grams of fat. But check this out. Their grass fed sirloin essentially has no fat and 27 grams of protein. There we go. So whether you're dieting and you want lower fat cuts or higher fat cuts, that's there. But you can also get yourself chicken. You can get yourself fish. You can get yourself scallops. You can get yourself all types of different meats. And I really suggest going to Good Life and venturing in and maybe playing around with your proteins. I mean, going back to the red meat, there's pecania. All kinds there's of stuff. chorizo sausage. There's maple bacon. What? That stuff's incredible. <laughs> the maple bacon is yes, so good. Yes, maple bacon is really good. Yo, my girl put those in these uh, bell peppers with uh, a steak oh, and chicken. Yes. And oh my God, it was so good. But either way, guys, protein is essential. And the Good Life is the place where you can get all of your high quality proteins. So Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you can head over to goodlifeproteins.com and enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Glenn Sturdevant. Hey, gents, my question has to do with lifting in a deficit. If I'm in a deficit and I need a surplus to add muscle, should I adjust my rep ranges to lower to the lower end to build strength? Hey, lifting in a deficit, I'm a deficit. I see what he's saying. Like he, he has less energy, so should he do less reps, right? Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's yeah. actually what Michael Hearn does. Oh, Hearn does with- that. Oh, Hearn will get into a deficit. He'll, you know, get really shredded and really lean, and that's usually when he'll do his singles and stuff like that. And he's he. There'll be way. There'll be. He's still incredibly strong, but they'll be way weaker mm-hmm. than where they normally would be when he's heavier. That's interesting. Yeah, he'll do like mm. sets of three, sets of five, even singles here and there. That's really interesting. I wonder, like, he does it also because, like, he loves the mental side. Okay. He's Michael Trent. So <laughs> because, like, so it's like a challenge for him because he's leaner. He's like, it's gonna feel harder. Um, because most people, you know, when you're in, when you're, when you start to feel tired in a deficit, that's like when, if you lift heavy, heavy for whatever you are, like, the it's riskier mm-hmm. because you don't have as much focus on what right. you're doing, right? I can get why Mike does that. It's riskier, but if you, in your head, you're paying attention and you're yeah. like, I got to scale this back. Never mind what you lifted in the past. Exactly. Just like lift and see what feels heavy to you at that time. Mm-hmm. It is uh, incredibly odd how much uh, like a 10 pound shift can make <laughs> yeah. in your strength. Um, obviously, it's very obvious when it comes to something like a pull up. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to do pull ups and you got a little extra. In, in your ass, <laughs> it's a little harder. You're like, yeah. damn, these are these are kind of sluggish. These are aren't easy. Um, but when you lose like ten pounds and you go to do like a deadlift or you go to do a squat or bench press, I know for me for bench press, like my arms will shake. Which you know, bench press is usually like solid for me. But yeah, just losing some weight sometimes uh, makes you feel a lot weaker. But I, I've noticed the same thing is that um, doing the lower rep ranges and just it, it seems like it's a, a good opportunity to kind of preserve some muscle mass by uh, sending a little bit of a different signal at that time. Mm. All right. Now, uh, Jacob Skoloff, you said you had a sandal question. Go ahead and ask it somewhere, and uh, we, we can answer your sandal question. Uh, rise above failure. And Seema, any advice for rib injuries when starting jujitsu? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, dog. Yeah, rib injuries are something that happen to a lot of people. And I think the stiffer you are, especially if you're coming from a strength background, again, it's not bad to be strong, but to get very strong, you build the adaptation of rigidness in the torso and rigidness in the spine. So your ability to rotate, your ability to bend, flex, all of that is uh, not as good as it potentially should be. And what that also does is if you now have lack of ability to extend your spine, to flex your spine and to rotate your spine, when somebody puts you in a position and you then have limited mobility of your spine, you also have limited mobility of your ribs and your rib cage isn't able to contort and move and rotate. So you have a higher likelihood of like pressure happening and a rib tweak happening. So with that being said, what you need to get better at is mobility and the movement of your spine, because what that's gonna do is gonna help your ribs. So lateral flexion, movements that help with that, movements that help with extension, flexion, rotation. 
all those things over time are going to allow you to be able to move and contort your ribs through space. Uh, and plug it, untapped is a program on the ATG app. All those things are programmed in there because you need those abilities. But like I said, um, movements are all out there for that. So if you can do movements where you're bending forward, like Jefferson curls, movements like a dumbbell pullover where you're extending your spine or the reverse Nordic, which has some regressions, but your spine is still extending backwards. Movements that have you getting into lateral flexion, like a QL raise. So the weight is now pulling you this way and pulling you that way. I know Andrew likes to do that on cable machines, so you can do it on cable machines too. Uh, movements that help with rotation. So if you can grab a med ball and you can do uh, med ball slams from side to side, again, trying to get rib movement in. And something that I really like is rope flow. This is something that you can do anywhere. It takes a little bit of time to like, you know, get the hang of it. But when you're doing rope flow, right, you're moving your spine in these rotational ways, right? Um, and this will also help you get better. As you get better at rope flow, you're also getting better at moving your spine and getting better at moving your spine means you're getting better at moving your ribs. Um, so all those things could be beneficial. And if you have better movement, you're going to have lesser risk of injury for your ribs. And your breathing, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so when you're doing some of these movements, you can kind of work on your breathing, especially mm -hmm. you might notice it with, uh, if you're tight and you go to do some rope flow, especially with the heavier rope, yeah. which isn't heavy, but it's it, it's heavier, mm -hmm. um, that rope gets a little distance from you and you you kind of feel yourself kind of tighten up and you got to learn to kind of breathe and gradually kind of go back and forth and, and really learn how to sway with it. And I think in jujitsu, I think a lot of times... Um, you know, obviously it's like the actual physical pressure that somebody's uh, putting on top of you, but it's also like, I think you're breathing, you know, so the better condition you get, I think you're going to end up with better results in all forms of competition in anything. But just imagine like if you have a better capacity to breathe and if you're in better condition and better shape, it's probably going to be a little easier to be able to breathe during the activity that you're doing. Mm -hmm. If it's getting to be harder, if I'm now breathing in and out of my mouth a lot and you're on top of me, now I'm like, I mean, I'm screwed anyway, but I'm like more screwed. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like you you mentioned there, the the pressure of another person. So there's there's two places where I think you have the highest chance of getting a rib injury. The first is a body lock. When pro somebody Please. puts you in a body lock and their their legs are now twisted around you and they lock that and then they press you down with their legs, that if your body isn't able to handle that pressure, that meaning you can't you relax with it, that's where you can have a rib tweak. The second place is going to be knee on belly. Knee on belly, it's a great, it's a, it's a great uh, control position. But if you're not able to breathe and have relaxed breathing into your diaphragm, once somebody gets knee on belly on you, you're just uh, that's a place where they're going to cook you. I like to cook people in knee on belly. It's a great position. But when people, if somebody puts me on knee on belly because my breathing is controlled. I don't mind that position that much. I kind of can feel comfortable there. I can let that knee sink into me and I can breathe around it and be soft with it because my breathing, I can breathe deep into my diaphragm and let this area relax. So another thing is over time, you're going to be able to all these areas, all these muscles around here, you're going to be able to let them relax so that when somebody now puts pressure on them, you're not super tense and super stiff. That makes those positions feel worse. Those positions will feel better if you're able to kind of relax into them. And then wait, find your opening to escape or, or move and find it. But if you're super tense, that makes all this shit suck way more. Yeah, think about if you were laid out on your back and put a decent sized kettlebell on your stomach. Yeah. And then you try to relax, it, your ability to relax, like if you're super tight through there, it's going to feel like myofascial release, right? It's going to feel intense. It's going to hurt. So you're probably going to and you're probably going to kind of like flex through it because mm -hmm. that's more comfortable for you to, it's like you got pressure on you and now you're pressurizing it yourself by flexing against it. And uh, I think over time you want some of that. Do you think that would be like a decent idea for some people to like try to practice, like yep. laying down and maybe having a little bit of weight on them and, and breathing and kind of working on it that way? That's a great idea. Um, and that's also a great idea to practice breathing into your diaphragm. We had, you know, uh, what's his name? Rare Barracuda, Richard Aceves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Richard Aceves came here. And one of the things that he has people do, and this is something that I was doing quite a bit. I still do it a bit here and there uh, just to practice, but I use my hands, is he'll have them put a kettlebell at the base of their, uh, kind of like above their pubic bone mm -hmm. and hold it there back on the ground. And your intention when breathing is to breathe so that this area comes up. Like you want this area, like the area by your that. psoas. I think that would hurt me quite a bit. So I got to give that a shot. Yeah. You want the kettlebell to rise as you're inhaling and then depress as you're exhaling. Because most, like a lot of people breathe, they're breathing here, they're kind of breathing here, 
but they're not having expansion of this area when they're breathing. And when you're doing, when you're able to do that, that means you're getting 360 degree expansion when breathing. And if that can become second nature, you're breathing, it's just going to have such a big effect on the way you breathe. Just think about like, if that area is tight, how much it affects everything that you do. Mm -hmm. You go to throw a ball, you go to run fast, you go to jump. I mean, anything that you do is really connected to kind of like near the belt, near your belly button and near your uh, pubic bone. So it sounds like it makes a lot of sense to try to like work those areas and, and maybe get something like a so right or, mm. you know, start digging in there and see if you can kind of get that area to be less uh, tight. Yeah. yeah. I get a wicked back pop when I do that. When I put a kettlebell like on top of like the pubic bone and then I breathe into it to mm. like raise it up and just like, oh, and it feels fantastic. And yeah. So everything that you guys said was, yeah, everything that I would know as well. But like the other thing would be just like to learn how to breathe in certain different ways too. So like if you do have the neon belly, like, well, now you're going to breathe up a little bit higher, you know, and stay calm that way versus, you know, if I don't know, you're stuck in side control, then you can breathe down in your stomach a little bit better and that sort of thing. But in the moment for me personally, it's hard to remember what the hell to do. So yeah. like, it's easy for me to say this, it's really <laughs> hard for me to practice though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question from 5 a.m. Any specific tips to building a hypertrophy leg workout? I'm happy that people want to work their legs. This yeah, we talked joy. a lot about we talked a lot about legs uh, in the beginning. But, both of them, but yeah, yeah, work both of them. That's like <laughs> great advice. <laughs> I do actually think that single leg work is uh, important, and um, it's something that probably gets neglected a lot. So some single leg uh, training is is a good idea. Um, I found for myself just a lot of basics were really helpful. I always liked uh, various forms of leg curls. Um, I've always liked various forms of leg extension, which I know leg extension doesn't really get much love, but I've always found it to be like an effective exercise. Leg press, squats, obviously. Um, but I don't think we need to like, you know, say like, look, man, if you're not squatting, like you're not, you're not worth a shit and it's just your workouts are dumb, <laughs> you know? Um I think that we have a tendency to say like the squat is the king, but a lot of times when it comes to like growth of the muscles of your legs, it has to do with whether you can squat proficiently. So if you don't squat well and you kind of just lean forward and you use your lower back, mm -hmm. that's like that's a good exercise maybe for overall strength and it's good for you to learn and get better at. Um, but that is an activity that's not really benefiting, you know, training your legs. So find exercises that you're not forcing yourself to do because of like some sort of social pressure or pressure from some somewhere else. Do the exercises that you feel the most and, and continue to like to explore and find those exercises. Yeah. I'm just going to kind of zone in on the single leg thing that you mentioned. Um, and specifically actually hamstrings because the lying hamstring curl is an amazing movement. Um, same with seated hamstring curls, but I would say people should do those with single legs. Because what happens with the, the most people when they're doing these movements is one leg will take over a little bit more than the other one doing a hamstring curl. And even though both of your hamstrings are curling, one's doing a little bit more work than the other. So adjust the load so that you can do the same rep range, but doing the hamstring curl with a single leg to assure that both hamstrings are as strong as each other and you build minimal imbalances. I say the same thing goes with leg extensions. If you love the leg extension, do single leg leg extensions because most of those machines are set up in a way where you can do one leg and the other leg. So lower the load to a point where you can do a single leg leg extension on one side, full range of motion, and not on the other side, again, to help deal with any imbalances because one leg is going to have a little bit more output than the other, no matter how, uh, how even you try to make your force production. Yeah. It's called a uh, reciprocal innervation. Basically oh, cool. you, you tell your, your leg, hey, I use both legs evenly. It cannot do that. Like, no matter how hard you try. Maybe if you're more in tune, like you, like you, you can, but you're doing single legs. Anyways. I'm still going to have one leg that's a little right. bit more. Uh, and then, so the other thing is like, for, for me, like I, I went away from compound movements and just focused more on like isolation stuff. So like the leg curl, the leg extension and that sort of thing. And that really helped with, helped me a lot with my legs. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the guys over at Mind Pump, they had a video a couple days ago. I sent it over to you guys. And they talked about the differences between exercises. And I think it was Sal, he was breaking it down. He had some uh, really interesting commentary. What he was talking about was the idea of like, if you do a, uh, a shoulder press, a standing dumbbell shoulder press, well, that taxes the body quite differently than like a seated 
dumbbell shoulder press. It taxes the body differently than a machine seated shoulder press. And so I think when you're trying to formulate your workout and trying to make your workouts, it's good to kind of think in these terms. You know, like a, a deadlift is just going to cost a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. A squat is going to cost a lot of energy. Um, these exercises are going to have an impact on the lower back. Now, I'm not saying good nor bad um, because um, it can be effective to help make you stronger by utilizing some of these uh, core movements, by utilizing the big three, by utilizing deadlifts and squats can be really effective. But at the same time, you might want to try to balance that out a little bit with a hack squat because mm. now it's like I can go on the hack squat. I can get everything I need from that. But what's taken out of the picture? My lower back is pretty much taken out of the picture. Yeah, I don't have to worry about my hamstrings recruiting a ton. I don't have to worry about maybe these other factors that you might have to worry about when you're trying to perform a squat. And if you're again, if your technique on your squat is something that's uh, hard for you to execute, I don't think you need to really worry about it a ton. I think that Again, for me, the growth of my legs and the shape of my legs improved so much more when I was done powerlifting because there was less focus. Again, the squat and some of those things, they were a foundation for me. It did help build some size. So I'm not saying it was, I definitely would never say that it was useless for me. But um, I don't squat with a really good, clean, upright posture. And if you look at the way that Tom Platts would squat, that is a great way to build your legs. But who else can squat like Tom Platts? Basically nobody. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to squat with that form. And that's why some athletes and some physique athletes uh, will utilize something like a Smith machine because now they're they're in a better, a better position. So again, I think the exercise selection, I think it's important for all muscle growth, but I think it's really important for your legs. Find exercises that don't hurt, it's not hurting your joints, not hurting your knees. It's not hurting your lower back. Like there's no reason for you to have to, you don't have to do any one of these exercises. You're going to be able to find a nice list of exercises that you're going to be able to build a good leg program off of. Yeah. And, you know, Dexter Jackson, I think famously only worked out with machines. Mm -hmm. But would you say that there are drawbacks? Because like, uh, would you say that there are drawbacks to working with mainly with machines? Yeah, I mean, for, you know, there's a lot of give and take, right? So the, with, uh, we had um, Chris Aceto on the podcast. Yeah. He hated machines. He does. <laughs> That's hated, all, hated all machines. So aggressively hated them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he hated them deeply. Ooh. He really had an issue with them. Um, a, a massive advantage of, of utilizing a machine is the fact that you don't really need a whole lot of warm up. It's like you can, you can get on a machine you can do the exercise and you can do like a set of five and you can rest like a minute and then do another set of like 10 or something. And then you're probably ready to go mm. almost like you're almost ready for your working sets. Whereas with free weights, you know, you're put on a plate and so forth and it might, it might take a while for you to warm up to the proper uh, weight. The disadvantages of using a machine could potentially be that you're not like, you know, working your core as much. Mm. And, um, but again, it's like, I, I still think a bigger muscle a lot of times is going to be a stronger muscle. I'm not a huge, uh, I don't really believe that there's like non-functional movements. <laughs> so like a machine may make you move into a certain position, um, but you're still overloading the muscle. Like I still think you're sending a message to the body. The one thing where that I don't agree with on a machine is just like, uh, the idea of isolating a muscle and trying to slap a lot of muscle onto one area yeah. is in and of itself a very unnatural thing that we just never had access to really before, uh, other than maybe carrying a bucket on one side and never carrying it on the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I start to think about, you know, like evolution and I start to think about some of those things, I'm like, well, you know, if somebody puts on an extra 30 pounds on their legs, <laughs> uh, that is probably a huge deviation from where they were naturally when they were younger. Uh, how bad that is or whatever, I, I don't really know. But if you put an extra 20, 30 pounds in your legs, well, now your stomach, I'm just imagining your stomach now needs to be a lot stronger mm. and so forth. And so if you did yeah. so with just machines and just isolation, uh, you could be looking at, which we see a lot of, not from all bodybuilders, but 
a lot of these clowns out there. <laughs> <laughs> inside joke on the clowns, but a lot of these, yeah. a lot of these clowns out there are, uh, you know, really stuck together. I'll, I'll include myself in that. I want you guys to please, if you're here, we have an episode with a guy named Jack Cruz coming up. Now, just remember what Mark said there. And when you listen to the episode of Jack Cruz, which is a great episode, by the way, you will. Uh, I'm actually scared of clowns. So you, I don't want yeah. to be lumped in with no, them. Yeah. <laughs> clowns yeah. are scary. Uh, actually, yeah, no. What? I don't know if we talked about this. We're going to get some more questions, guys, but what, I don't know sure I should mention that on there. What are your phobias? Do you have a phobia? You guys know mine. Uh, trypophobia. Yep. Ugh, I don't trip. really know if I have like much of a, a phobia, mm. but I, I, I would be like, I mean, I guess everyone like heights is not a phobia, but like I, I would be, I would be, I wouldn't like jump off the side of a, even like a small cliff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I just, I just wouldn't, when I was younger, I would do shit like that, but I just, mm. I would just. Yeah, I would be scared to do that. But a phobia wise, I'm not really sure. I don't like stuff that like comes from the body. Like, <laughs> like seeing vomit. And yeah, like, yeah, like pus, pus and yep. like shit like that. Because like it comes from a hole. Pimple popper, God, you know, it. like all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, you don't like pimple popping shit? No, I don't. Dude, Sam, that chicks is her love thing. That. I know that. That's a she chick will thing. sit there while she's like eating her food and she'll just like watch pimple popping. I know that women love to pop zits too. Yeah. She, they get all excited. They're like, oh, you got a pimple. And they get like, chase your mm-hmm. house or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't have like a phobia. Like I can watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Pimple popping videos are, they, they, they are nice though. I, mm. I, I get, I get the alert. Um, I've mentioned this before. And again, if any of you, <laughs> yeah. if any of you fuck with this with me, I will fuck you up and I'm not even joking. Okay. <laughs> we, we know. Yeah. Ventriloquist dummies. <laughs> oh yeah. Those things are terrifying. That's yeah, like a clown kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That's shit. Vibes. Scared me since I was a kid when I saw Goosebumps. Slappy the dummy. He's this redheaded dummy with the green eyes. And he's a dick. He, oh, he was a dick. There's a scene me. where he was like spinning on a ceiling fan. That shit fucked me up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> shit fucked that, me up uh, for life. <laughs> and then what's that called? Uh, uh, what? Ventriloquist? I don't know. If the, Is I don't it know. like a There's phobia? definitely a phobia. It has to be a phobia though. name for it, right? But I will not be in a room with that. And I swear to God. And it has if, the things, right? They're like, yep. uh, yeah, what are those things? Yeah, like it's little... just the mouth thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a comedian that like his whole shtick oh, yeah, is yeah. ventriloquist dummies. No, I'll, no, I'll never go to that show. Oh, little, I, I've yeah. seen yeah. that guy. Something uh, Bratton. Uh, I forgot his name, but. I don't know, but it, I I mean, I can't even pronounce this word, but automatonophobia. Mm. Yeah, what, what's the, so what's it mean? Automatonophobia. Which defined as a persistent, abnormal, and unwarranted fear of ventriloquist dummies. Anima- and, and yeah. animatronic shit creatures or wax statues I had Yo, a, wax I statues fucking suck too had a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese when I was six or seven years <laughs> old and I was sad the whole time because <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys know at Chuck E. Cheese they have the big animatronic things that go like this in the uh-huh, background uh-huh. and the kid has to go on stage and sing happy birthday or whatever oh. that shit fucked me up and I don't oh god god no 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 <laughs> no 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 <laughs> That sucks. Anyway. Twisted. Yeah. How many more questions do you guys want to take? A few more. A few more? All right, yeah. cool. Um, Jeff Dunham. Yeah, that's his Jeff name. Dunham. <laughs> Ugh, Jeff Dunham. Jeff yeah. Dunham. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> uh, best things to focus on with your clients as a fitness coach. And this question comes from Liam Turner Bouchamp or Bouchon. I don't know. Mm. Uh-huh. Best things to focus on as a fitness coach. I think all of us are going to agree that... You know, you want some good performance metrics. You know, you want to see uh, the person just getting better in the gym. They're able to move better. They're able to lift a little bit better. Maybe their strength is going up. You don't have them kind of focusing on performance. And hopefully uh, in your effort to get them focused on performance, hopefully they start to buy into other things that you're saying. And hopefully they'll start to adhere to the nutrition that you're communicating with them as well. Yeah. Because that's usually the hardest thing. I mean, you know, somebody could, you know, get great results if they, with like just some haphazard lifting and like losing 30 pounds. Mm. And someone would be like, oh my God, what'd you do? You look, you know, you look great. Uh, But for a trainer, you know, a lot of times the people that go to a trainer, I think they're kind of expecting you to uh, do maybe a lot more for them. You're, they're, they're expecting you to kind of solve this problem for them. And, uh, so with that, I think the hardest part is you got to try to really work towards gaining their trust so that you can get them to um, 
follow you, not just not just follow what you're doing when you're together, but also following some of your principles when you're not together. Yeah, dude. I think um, one of the coolest things about coaching people is learning about them because like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you can write out a program and you can write out a nutrition plan, but we know that like the things that are going to allow you to have the biggest long-term change are helping them adjust their lifestyle habits, right? So is this a person that they always go to sleep super late? They're always watching TV before bed. They're eating super close to bed. Uh, they have, they don't go outside in the morning. They don't take walks. Mm-hmm. When they go and they do stuff with friends, there's always alcohol involved or copious amounts of food. I think one of the best things you can do as a coach is spend that time learning about what they do on a day-to-day basis, learning what they do on their weekends. Because these are the things that if you can help them take small steps to fixing, right? So instead of drinking Friday, Saturday, Sunday, can, <laughs> can we just like, you know, can we cut that to two of those days and maybe do a little bit less drinking? Or can we maybe do one of those days? I had a friend tell me, he's like, <laughs> I, I was like, hey man, what have you been doing? You, you're, you're looking great. And he's like, I only drink on the weekend. And I'm like, Today's Thursday. <laughs> and he had a drink, he had a drink in his hand. He goes, Well, he's like, today <laughs> he's like, today's like, you know, special occasion. And I was Different. like, and I was like, is Friday uh a weekend for you too? You know, because no. that's always like funny. He's like, Yeah, he's like, so I was like, now it's gonna go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? Mm-hmm. He's yeah. like, Yep, pretty much. And that's the thing, man. We know that if you can slowly just adjust certain things in terms of your lifestyle. First off, working with that person is going to be so much easier if their lifestyle habits are optimized. That means they're going to stick to their diet better. They'll be able to better have better workout results because maybe their sleep's better and they're, they're have, they have better energy. But long-term, now that they're not with you anymore, they know the habits that you guys talked about being important. Mm -hmm. The fucking sleep, the getting consistent walks and sunlight, all these things, they know how important these things are. And they'll maintain this even when you stop, because if it's only a workout and nutrition plan, like that's 90 minutes of the gym Mm -hmm. and then the food they put in their mouth, but what's going on everywhere else. Mm -hmm. We can optimize those habits. You can change somebody's life. So yeah, sometimes people go as far to say like exercise doesn't really do much, <laughs> well, and and yeah. it would be it's it is kind of hard to see the impact, the positive impacts of exercise, if you're covering it up with too much food. You really won't. You honestly won't see much change. Maybe there's some uh, maybe there's some things with your blood that get better. Maybe your bone density gets better. Maybe you are a little stronger and stuff like that. But for the most part, you won't really look different. And you might not even be hardly any healthier. You're going to have to figure out a way to get into those habits. And it's, it sucks. It's a, it's a, not an easy thing to do because, and I think that's what's so, um, why nutrition sometimes is almost a little bit like a religion almost. And when somebody, you know, uh, wants to confront somebody about their nutrition, they can be really resistant Mm. because they feel like it's an attack on their life. Like you're a slob, you're lazy, you're a piece Mm. of shit. Mm. And unfortunately, it usually does mean that you have to work on uh, these new habits. And and these new habits are, for us, they sound um, so normal because we've been talking about it for so long and Mm -hmm. we've been practicing a lot of these things for so long. But uh, just for someone to cut back on alcohol, there's no need to talk about other changes, you know? Hey, could you figure out a way to maybe just, uh, you know, how many times, how many days a week do you drink now? And they say four. Say, can we, can you meet me in the middle here? Can we go half? Can you go half that. How many drinks do you usually have? Six. Can you go to like four or three and still have a good time? You know? Start slow. Yeah. Start slow. With and the just, intention of helping them <laughs> really slow. Well, and yeah. And, and even if you mess up, it's like you still... It's just like the gym, you know, if you, if you currently are doing zero curls and you Mm -hmm. start doing three sets of curls here and there, if your consistency wavers a little bit, it's not a huge deal. At least, at least there's some consistency, at least you're working on it and at least you're trying. I think that's all you can do as a trainer is to try to continually encourage and a lot of communication. I think that that's another thing is like, if you don't hear from your client, you know, if you're working (laughs) with someone like online. Yeah. And, and, or like digitally via email or something like that. And you don't really hear from them. Like, you know, like they're, they're not going to send you a picture and be like, Hey bro, 8% body fat. (laughs) 
they're going to be like, dude, I gained 60 pounds. <laughs> you didn't hear from him for like a year or something. Yeah. To, to dive deeper on that, I was talking to uh, one of our buddies, Rusty Drake. He's been following the show for a long time. And what he'll do is like, I don't know if you guys ever did this or like signed up for a, a, like a personal training one-on-one thing. When I did that, it was like, oh, go walk on the treadmill. And then like half an hour later, he's like, all right, so what do you want to do? And like, he wrote down a couple of things. All right, cool. We'll come back tomorrow. It was like bullshit, right? <laughs> Russ will actually have somebody like, oh, meet me at this coffee shop. Like he doesn't even bring them into the gym and he just has a conversation and gets to know the person. Oh yeah. So by the end of that conversation, they're just friends and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, like, yes, I do want to hire you as my coach. And this guy's crushing it. He'll get people to sign up for like years in advance. So just getting to know somebody goes a huge long way, you know? So like definitely don't overlook that. But, um, uh, Mike Dolce put out a, a pretty cool video because somebody had asked like, oh, what's the most uh, efficient or what's the what's your favorite uh, machine or, or piece of equipment in the gym? And he's like, the front door. <laughs> he's like, the more times you use that machine, the better your results are going to be. So making sure that your clients are getting into that front door and being consistent, whatever it takes for that to happen, then, you know, focus on that because then obviously you're going to have a, a better looking client and a better, you know, better results and all that stuff. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Dope. All right. Quickie from Dom Sornberger. And see my question. Olipop or Zevia? Olipop all day long. Zevia, yo, I could kill a bunch of Olipops and it's not a good idea to do. But <laughs> Zevia will give me the worst fucking bubble guts and then my shit's a little bit off. Mm. Even though it tastes great. So mm. Olipop wins all day fucking long. Olipops are the best. Best flavors are Tropical Punch. <laughs> classic Grape. I had to say Classic Grape second because... I know what you're thinking. Um, the orange squeeze, orange squeeze is very, very good. Orange strawberry is pretty good. Orange strawberry exists. Mm-hmm. Orange strawberry. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, not strawberry vanilla. Orange strawberry. I think it's orange strawberry. <laughs> oh my god! I have oh, to try I miss, that. Maybe I. Maybe uh, do oranges made that and up? strawberries taste good together? Well, I don't they, know. they sound like they should. They but might. if that's a real flavor, that might be fucking amazing, dude. Yeah. There's a lot of fiber in those things. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you telling me? Yeah. Get a big old poop going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even mess with sparkling water anymore. <laughs> yeah, you, you Mr. Artificial, no artificial sweeteners. I don't do anything. All I do is drink water out of a mason jar. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of losing it, guys. Like, I'm, I'm happy gonna to hear be, it, man. If I could grow hair, I would, and I fucking wouldn't put on deodorant. I'd be a hippie, and yeah. I would just have... Bare, bare feet all day long. Let's go, dude. Fucking meditating and floating and just stinking up the room. Where are you at with Bitcoin? <laughs> I still <laughs> have it. I've never sold. <laughs> are you uh, decentralizing that too? No, I think Mike Niddle told me to move it over to something and uh, I never looked back. I, don't, I, don't know. I got, I, I, I fell for the hype when it was really high. You yeah. might be there next. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Bitcoin, running around with a tin hat. Definitely mm. moving to Mexico after Jack Cruz. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> John Rafferty asks, favorite everyday running shoes? Uh, I'd have to say the Escalantes are yeah. probably my favorite. I just like wearing those for just about anything. Both of you guys, Escalantes? Uh, no, I would just say the uh, Riv- Riveras, I think, they're, but they're also another ultra shoe. Mm-hmm. They're, they're the red ones that I wear. Yeah. They're just, they're way too comfortable. Like I do the, everything in those. Yeah, you ultra. were wearing some ultras yes the other day, right? Yeah, they're, they're the super running things. Yeah, what yeah. are they? I forgot what they're called, but they're the super shoes mm-hmm. with the carbon footplate. Yeah, I forget what they're called too, but they're nice. I use those for sprinting. So I mean, I would use it. I use it as an everyday running shoe too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, but you know, super I think shoes. The Escalante is nice in the sense that uh, it's just a decent shoe in general. It's mm-hmm. good for walking. So yeah. Mm. All right, another few questions. Two more. Two more. This one I think will be kind of quick with. It's an interesting one. I'm curious where our minds go with this. But Dylan Burnett asks, any suggestions for in-gym movements to help improve bouldering and rock climbing? Damn. Yeah. I think body weight stuff. So like mm-hmm. pull-ups are going to be pretty good for you to do. Um, anything that allows you to kind of like pinch your fingers against. So like plate pinching uh, um, grip work. Right. Because when you're bouldering and rock climbing, like it's not just like you need grip strength, you need finger strength too. And pinching plates and walking is going to help build that. I also think hip flexor work is super Mm. necessary because you notice when people are bouldering, they have to pick up their legs and put them in weird spots. Right. So you want good strength and a long range with your hip flexors. 
So anything that can work that. What else comes to mind? I would say something like maybe like a deadlift, you know, yeah. exercises like that. And then trying to, I would imagine that if you're a decent at like rock climbing type stuff, that you're probably going to be pretty strong on a deadlift. Yeah. Your strength to weight ratio is probably really good. Mm -hmm. um, farmers carries, um, sled work, I think would be good. Like trying to build up like your butt and your legs, some sort of maybe like leg press or something like that. Kind of mentioning what you're talking about where you're, your your leg is going to be like in this weird compromised position that you have to kind of push from. Maybe even something like step-ups, but like weighted step-ups, you know, because you're going to get your foot on like a little ledge and then mm -hmm. probably wedge yourself up. And I think just a lot of basics would be good. Like even like things like curls, you know, getting getting really strong with, with a exercise like a curl would probably be of benefit as well. I think there's these handles from Gripzilla, right? And they... They uh they kind of allow you to put mm. your fingers in and do pull ups, so those are good because when you're when you're doing rock climbing stuff, you need that. So not just pull ups, but I'm pretty sure at rock climbing centers, I know this isn't in the gym, but rock climbing centers they have these uh, boards where mm. it's like different levels of thickness coming out of the wall where you can do pull ups, but you're using your fingers to do those pull ups. And really good rock climbers are able to do that. Like literally they're doing pull-ups like this. <laughs> That's crazy. Right? What's that it's movement? Insane. Is it like just a pegboard uh, that they have like for ro like the CrossFitters do it, right? Yeah. They just stick. Like that's got to be amazing for rock climbing. That Absolutely. seems really difficult. Absolutely. I wonder if anything like, um, because in my head, I'm just thinking like if you are climbing up a rock, you want your reaction to be pretty good. So like throwing a tennis ball against the wall and catching mm -hmm. it or maybe doing a pull up and having somebody throw a ball at you, you catch it and kind of pass it back. Something just to- Concentration while yeah, you're doing yeah, something. Yeah, something Probably like that. really effective. I couldn't give you any examples of something like legit but I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe look into something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Okay. Now, this is a really good one. And it's from James Gallegos again. How often should I train to failure? If I lift three times or six times per week, that's a very big difference, my friend. Mm -hmm. One set or one exercise per day, assuming I get good sleep and enough calories. Interesting. I think, you know, there's a big difference between like going to failure and like getting close to it, you know, um, you know, I think if it's a muscle group that you really do want to improve, I think you can do it for multiple sets and I think you can do it for multiple exercises, um, where you can kind of, you know, brush up against it. And so I would say, um, you could probably do that, you know, a handful of times in a given workout would probably be adequate. You know, say you're trying to build up your chest. Uh, I would say you could probably get a good four or five sets that you've taken to close to failure with maybe two or three different exercises. I think normally, like from what I've seen from people bodybuilding and just some of my own experiences is usually you're not like brushing up next to failure on everything that you do, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there's certainly not in like your warmups and certainly not like when someone's like, oh, I did like four sets of 10 of that. The first, um, the first 20 reps, the first two sets are um, kind of to butter you up for the <laughs> following two sets, right? Uh, so the next, so it's like the next two sets will be taken or close to failure. The first two were still like just getting your body prepared for that. So um, I, I always think that, again, I think the inadequate rest, I think works really great. Resting about a minute in between sets and... Um, you know, repeated efforts with the same weight. I think that that's something that people, they want to keep adding weight. They want to go from 50 to 55 to 60. It's like, well, just stick with the 50s and set number one and set number two are going to be fairly easy. And set number three and four are going to be the ones that are going to be a little tougher. So I think about half of your working sets for the day could be something that are close to failure. And then choose something that you can do maybe some drop sets with. So I'm going to use your example that you gave right there. First two sets with 50 pounds, solid. The next set is rougher, right? And then for your last set, do that 50 pounds until one rep or maybe it's a failure, drop it by 10 pounds. Do another set close to failure or at failure, drop it again, 10 pounds. Do that last set. We'll call it like maybe a single Shit arm. It feels good. Right? It, it, but, but the thing is, is think about like, I, I love doing that because you're stimulating so many fibers. By the time you get to like maybe using 30 pounds for it, maybe you manage 10 reps and you feel every fucking thing. Mm. But the thing about that, the reason why it's beneficial is because you already had 
prior sets that were good sets of that movement. Now you're gassing it out, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like a pre-fatigue, yeah. Exactly. Now, this isn't something you need to do every day. When you become adept and you get better at recovery, you can do it more often. But try it twice a week with certain movements. See how you feel workout to workout. And then as you get better at handling that type of failure or volume to, with failure, you can increase your frequency of doing that. Do you guys think something like dog crap training might be a better approach or just different? I any, like the idea of the dog crap stuff. I think it's, uh, but it's more like a faster pace thing, I yeah. think, you know, yeah, yeah. so. Is dog crap rest pause or is it something yeah, else? Yeah, rest pause. Oh, yeah, it's five okay. sets in a row, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, I think it's more like, um, I mean, you could utilize it for all kinds of stuff, but I think uh, in this case, like this guy could utilize it like for one, you would only use dog crap stuff for like one exercise. Mm. You wouldn't want to use it for multiple things on, uh, in a given day, I don't think. Yeah. It was a little too intense to do too much of it. Mm -hmm. There's one last question that's really good. I, I think you guys are enjoy this one. So last question from Namatha. Now, real quick, guys, all these names are in this bucket. I want to let you know. What? To be able to win, because we're giving away Joy Mode, Vivo, Hostage, Good Life, mm. and within you, you got to be part of the drink. Discord. Yes. <laughs> you got to be part of the Discord, right? If your name's called, message me. Give me that information. Email, name, fiscal address. Um, and you will potentially win. But Namatha asks, hey, recommendations for someone who has never been over 180 pounds and is way too comfortable being hungry a lot of the time. Any tips with eating motivation without eating crap? Mm. That's a great question, Matha. It's a great fucking question. Well, what do we know about hunger? You know, what are things that can help? What are th what are things that can help kind of cue your hunger? Um, it does seem like carbohydrates can sometimes mm -hmm. uh, make it a little easier to eat more food for multiple reasons. You know, if you have some ground beef, it's not that hard to eat ground beef. Ground beef can taste great, but if you have some rice with it and some butter. <laughs> and then it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So you can add some calories to things uh, that way. Anything with butter. I was yeah. going to say butter just helps everything. That's true. <laughs> All right, we solved your problem. Eat a lot of butter. <laughs> eat a lot of butter. Yeah. Well, you know, that is a good point because it's energy dense, right? And it's not going to um, take up room in your stomach and it's not going to be something that's going to make you full. So you want to look at food maybe quite the opposite way that what we usually preach on the show, which is like, let's try to have you get a lot of volume in and let's try, have you try to get in a lot of protein while also uh, not over consuming calories, yeah. right? So you want to look at it from the other spectrum. You want to get in a lot of calories. Um, obviously you still need your protein is still critical, but you do want to kind of keep in mind that your protein for the most part shouldn't be super lean. Um, Maybe some of it's lean so that you don't gain a ton of body fat, but for the most part, you're probably looking at like eating like whole eggs, eating like uh, ribeyes and uh, things that are maybe a little eating lamb and 85% uh, uh, lean ground beef and stuff like that is probably a really good route to go. Yeah. And like, uh, I, you know, rice, I feel like is very easy to make good so you can get a lot of carbohydrates in. Cause I would, you know, you, you mentioned that you want to do this without eating crap. Right. So it's like, if you don't want to eat like cereal and shit, I think that's a good idea in Amatha because when you start eating cereal and all that stuff to try to gain weight, it's very easy to gain a lot of body fat very quickly. But when it comes to something like rice, like Dan Efferding's vertical diet, the concepts from there, he has these athletes mix up ground beef, butter, rice, like peas, all this shit. It ends mm -hmm. up being fucking amazing. You can get in a lot of calories. You're not eating crap. You're still eating whole foods. So I, that is a, if you want to have a whole food approach, like usually we mentioned, don't mix a lot of fats with carbs. <laughs> it's time for you to party, baby. <laughs> it's um, time for you to party. I got to mention rice and grinds. Like that stuff is oh, amazing. Yeah. It's got so like good. so many different flavors. They got like a waffle syrup one. They have a, or maple syrup one or whatever the hell that is. It goes down easy. They have, yeah, they go down easy. Um, I think even like two or three scoops of that is like 50 to 75 carbs and it's it's like nothing. You're able to eat through it real easy. So they have a lot of different flavors. You might want to check out that product. All right. Cool. cool. All right. So guys, we're going to be giving away some shit now. Mark, mm -hmm. you want to pick the first person? This out. first person is going to win a year's supply oh. or maybe, let's see. A year's supply of hostage shape goes to Namatha. Perfect. Good for you. Namatha wins. Wasn't a setup. Right, one. Namatha. 
One second. Before you pick that, I need to write this down. Hostage tape. I love me. Before you pick, tape. shake that up a little bit more because I feel like I thought I shook it up, but maybe the math was. Did you dig or? And when you when you pick, kind of dig in there. Don't don't pick the one from the top. So I don't know. Get, get those know fingers how, deeper. Yeah, get those fingers. Oh, you pick. Okay, okay, okay. The next person, Nicholas Bradian, you're gonna win. Some joy mode. We want Ooh, you to have boner a drink. We want you to have a big old dick for the Yay. for the girl or the guy who you might be uh, having some fun with. We're totally inclusive. Gonna here send on this you show. that and a pair of gray sweatpants. Yeah, <laughs> for bench day. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, take some joy mode and then go work out in the gym. Joy, joy mode should make gray sweatpants, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, that's a great Our one. next winner, five a.m. You win. I, I I know who you are on Discord. Yeah, send me send me a message. You're gonna win a pair of Vivo barefoot shoes of your choice. I'm gonna send you a code for that. Five a.m. Next person is going to win. Let's see. Dylan Butner, you win. Uh, some meat from Good Life Proteins. Mm. So you're gonna get a gift card to Good Life Proteins for some meat. Have you guys had their smart chicken? Yeah. What? It yeah. is so damn good. Wait, wait. What the fuck is smart? Chicken? I have no idea what That's it is. That's the first company that they started and they they ended up, they they sold it, but it's part of Good Life Proteins and Piedmontese and everything. Dude, we all we did was we put it in the air fryer and it was like the juiciest, tenderiest. It was incredible. Was it breast? It's thigh? just chicken, was chicken breast, dude. That's the thing. It's chicken breast. And chicken breast. Up- and it was, and, and I, I know, I know I, I, I've always had chicken breast and like, you know, you guys clown on me for the lean stuff. But this did not taste like a regular dry ass chicken breast. Why this, is it called Smart Chicken? Then do they do that? Something that I have chicken? no idea. I don't know. What the fuck. That's just the brand. Interesting. It um, was dude. It was incredible. Like I'm gonna get it again, dude. Okay, what is that? Did did uh, did did you get the two? I don't know. But the, it's like these are uh, short ribs. They're like two, mm, a big pack that. of fucking mm, so good. Like uh, the last month, I wasn't sure how I was gonna cook it, but it was like <laughs> bi- a big old fucking thing of ribs. And then I finally defrosted it because I'm like, okay, I need to cook this bitch up. I'll figure this out. I opened it and it was like, you could break it into two big slabs. Mm. I just had to put that thing in the air fryer, mm. put some seasoning on it, air fried it. Perfect. Mm. You, I just put, I cooked a bunch of ribs in the fucking air fryer. That's so cool. It was pretty great. It's so I wonder good. what it was. We got to pick one more, but I'll, 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 I'll send you a picture when I get home. All right, this last person's going to win a gift card to Within You Supplements. You get yourself some protein, some fasting gum. Yeah, I need steak you shake so bad. Steak shake, actually. Get yourself a fucking, um, get yourself the, the Total Carnivore because that shit's good. John Rafferty, are you going to be making more flavors of Total Carnivore or is it just chocolate? Yeah, I have a, a vanilla malt and like what? A mocha, I think, coming out soon. Malted milk. <laughs> Malted milk. Ooh, yeah, like bro. That, that yeah. what it's called, Andrew? No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I thought you I got just, the inside scoop. Not yet. Yeah. So John Rafferty, we're going to send you a gift card from within you. Y'all got to make sure you're part of the Discord. You need to message me. If you don't message me, you don't get your shit. And then don't get mad at me two weeks later <laughs> asking me for it because I'm probably not going to look at the message. I'm just being real. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but thank you guys. It's, it's good answering all these questions. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. And uh, it was cool to talk about hypertrophy today rather than talking about everybody being hurt. <laughs> The last, one, the last one depressed me. I was like, man, everyone's really fucked up out there. <laughs> oh, God. Injury sucks, but mm-hmm. yeah. Strength is never weak. This week, this never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. If you guys enjoyed this episode, check out this one right here where we answer all your questions about injury because a lot of you guys fucking got injuries and we've been injured too. That's why we wanted to help you. So click right here. All your questions about injury answered.